for uh, joining us uh, for this very important roundtable discussion. But before we proceed, I'd like to go over some items for our remote roundtable to ensure that everyone can participate in a meaningful way. First, if you are experiencing connectivity issues, please make sure you or your staff contact our designated technical support so those issues can be resolved immediately. To ensure members and participants can have robust engagement, I ask that members participating remotely continue to remain visible on camera for the duration of their participation in the roundtable, unless they experience connectivity issues or other technical problems that render the member unable to fully participate on camera. Also, I ask that all participants remain muted when not speaking so that background noise does not interfere when someone else is speaking. Regarding the format of the roundtable, it is my intention that the discussion be as conversational as possible. However, given the large number of, part the large number of participants and the need to keep things moving, it will be necessary to have some structure. Accordingly, it is my intent to move through the bill title by title with 10 to 20 minutes per section, depending on the number of member questions. I would also ask that members and participants raise their hands should they have questions. And I will do my best to alternate between members of the majority, minority, and participants from the VSOs. In addition, I ask that members and participants keep their questioning and comments to a couple of minutes so that we can cover as much ground as possible. Does any member have a question about the procedures for this roundtable? Hearing none and seeing none will proceed. Well, today I'm thrilled to welcome our esteemed veterans advocates and veteran service organizations to this virtual roundtable to discuss two critically important matters to our veterans and their families, in-service toxic exposures and the Honoring Our PACT Act. When we sent our service members into harm's way, we made a pact to care for them and pay for that care when they came home. For too long, Congress and the Department of Veterans Affairs have been slow to act, citing high costs or lack of absolute scientific proof. The result, a disability benefit claims process that is cumbersome and places the burden to prove toxic exposure on veterans themselves. Every day, more and more veterans speak out about exposure to environmental hazards and other toxic substances during their military service. Recently, I put out a call encouraging toxic exposed veterans to share their experiences with the committee. As of this morning, the committee has heard from over 400 veterans in 48 states. These reflections are very powerful, and I'd like to share some with you now. Navy veteran Ed B. described how toxic exposures could overwhelm the senses. He wrote, quote, you couldn't escape, in brackets, the jet fuel. You could see it, smell it, and taste it, end quote. I heard from Marine veteran Mike M. who said, quote, even when we weren't actively engaged in dumping items into the burn pit, we were still exposed, end quote. Air Force veteran Christopher R. described his dealings with VA, stating, quote, I continue to be rejected because they say it's impossible to prove that it is service related. I never worked with chemicals before my service or since. I feel like a nuisance to the VA health system, end quote. I heard from the widow of Army veteran Austin Monk, who said, quote, no wife should have to bury her 22-year-old husband because of his exposure to unsafe conditions while in service to his country, end quote. Listening to their stories, it is incredibly clear to me that we need to pass the Honoring Our Pact Act now. The speaker has committed to bringing this bill to the floor very soon. So we need to be prepared to bring the best possible version of this bill to the floor. This bill has gone through the full legislative process, including a full committee legislative hearing and markup. This is now the time to bring together stakeholders and committee members to discuss the path forward, where there is common ground, and where we need to get down the brass tacks to get this bill ready for the floor. Our bipartisan bill will address the full gamut of issues affecting toxic exposed veterans, access to high to, the access to VA care and benefits 
while reforming VA's presumptive decision-making process. It will open up VA healthcare for more than 3.5 million veterans exposed to burn pits and establish a presumption of service connection for over 23 respiratory illnesses and cancers. It's time Congress and the American people back up. Thank you for your service with action. Toxic exposed veterans have held up their part of the pact. Now it's our turn. The CBO estimate for the Honor Our Pact Act is in. Now we know the true cost of our promise, but we cannot renege on our responsibility to toxic exposed veterans because of any preconceived sticker shock. Over the past 20 years, Congress and our country have made the choice to spend trillions on other priorities while sending service members into harm's way at a cost of $6.4 trillion. We know that this Congress is willing to find money when it wants to, as it recently demonstrated by adding $25 billion to the last national defense authorization. So the question is, how can we improve this bill to ensure the fullest support and its passage? I'm eager to hear what my colleagues across the aisle would like to change that would still uphold this sacred promise. When our country goes to war, we don't nickel and dime the Department of Defense, and we shouldn't try to pinch pennies when it comes to covering the care for toxic exposed veterans. It's time to pass the Honor in Our Pact Act. And I'm grateful to have all of you here for our discussion today. Ranking Member Bost, I would like to give you the opportunity to add any opening remarks before we introduce our guests. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, I want to thank everyone here for joining us today. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to each one of you for your commitment to our veterans, the veterans uh, you or your, organi your organizations represent, uh, understand the challenges posed by toxic exposure all too well. You know, during our markup last June, we discussed those challenges with respect to Chairman DeCano's PACT Act. The committee was painfully under, under prepared to vote on the bill at that point. We were working off a minimal cost information from CBO and a radio silence from the Biden administration. We now have some of the information and that and it's clear that we have more to do more work to do. And I appreciate the roundtable as a first step. But given the focus on the PAC Act, we will not be able to discuss everything we need to today, for example, we would likely won't have the opportunity to discuss the new work that the VA is doing to better support toxic exposed veterans at this time. VA recently, recent actions should inform our work on this issue, not repeat or compete with it. And as I have said before, we need to work as partners on a parallel path with each other and the Senate to get this done. We have not done that thus far. And our work to support toxic exposure, exposed veterans has suffered for it. I understand the Senate is currently exploring a phased, phased approach to address toxic exposure that would prioritize care for those who need it now. I think that's wise. Those of us who attended last year's legislative hearing may remember Jim Price's testimony. Jim is a combat veteran whose wife, Lauren, tragically passed away from conditions likely linked to toxic exposure. I know many of you work with Lauren and miss her dearly. To quote Jim's testimony, benefits are great, but they mean nothing to somebody that is dead because they didn't get care, end quote. Jim put it perfectly. We need to focus on taking action steps now to expand care to those who need it most before it's too late. Additionally, we still need to identify a way to pay for toxic exposure legislation. CBO estimates that, that the PAC Act would cost roughly $280 billion in a new mandatory spending and $147 billion in new discretionary spending. We don't have hundreds of billion dollars in offsets laying around. Last week, I opposed the veterans bill on the floor in part because I believe we needed to preserve offsets for toxic exposure and make that focus be there. 
I remain committed to finding a way to support toxic exposed veterans in a way that is fiscally responsible for future generations. I believe we can do that. Speaking as a veteran myself, I don't think that's too much to ask. Veterans are taxpayers too. We should be mindful of how we spend their money on their behalf. I look forward to seeing where each of you organizations might be on uh, or might be on all of these items and to be honest and robust discussion that we need to have uh, this afternoon about the way moving forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this round table and I look forward to uh, uh, the discussion here today. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Bost. I will now uh, introduce our participants from the Veterans Advocacy and VSO communities. Joining us this afternoon is Mr. John Stewart, Veterans Advocate. Mr. John Field, Veterans Advocate. Ms. Rosie Lopez Torres, Executive Director, Burn Pits 360. Mr. Patrick Murray, Director of National Legislative Service, Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States of America. Mr. Shane Learman, Deputy National Legislative Director, Disabled American Veterans. Mr. Ronald Brown, Toxic Wounds Consultant, Vietnam Veterans of America. Lindsay Church, Executive Director, Minority Veterans of America. Mr. Alex uh, Maruski, uh, Deputy Director of Government Affairs, Wounded Warrior Project. Ms. Jan Birch, Government Relations and Communications Associate, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Mr. Adbayith Tompi, uh, Tompi uh, Legislative Associate, the American Legion. Mr. Corey Titus, Director of Veterans Benefits and, and Guard Reserve Affairs, Military Officers, the Military Association, Military Officers Association of America, MOA. Mr. Roscoe Butler, Associate Legislative Director, Paralyzed Veterans of America, and Mr. Jim Vale, National Service Director of Veterans Benefits and Policy, Blinded Veterans Association. In the interest of time and to keep things moving, I'd like to begin our discussion and turn to Title I of the uh, bill, Expansion of Healthcare Eligibility for Toxic Exposed Veterans. Uh, Mr. Morosky, can you share Wounded Warriors Project, Wounded, the Wounded Warrior Project's perspective on the language of that section? Uh, your, Mr. Morosky, your sound is still... Can you hear me? I can hear you now, go ahead, proceed. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. Uh, Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Boss, and members of the committee. I'm Alex Morosky from Wounded Warrior Project. Um, I want to thank you for holding this roundtable um, and for inviting us to participate in this discussion on the Honoring Our PACT Act. It's a bill we strongly support. Um, I want to start off by acknowledging that there were many toxic exposure uh, bills introduced this Congress. And what you've done with the PACT Act is you've put them together to create a comprehensive solution for veterans who were exposed. Um, and while there are many necessary provisions in this bill that I know that we'll be discussing today, which include uh, presumption, concession of exposure, scientific framework, I have to take a couple minutes to talk about Title I, which would finally expand permanent VA healthcare enrollment eligibility to all veterans who were exposed during their military service, regardless of their disability claim status. Um, we believe this is absolutely critical, not only for veterans who are already suffering from exposure-related illnesses, but from a preventative care standpoint as well. Um, and I would like to point out that Vietnam veterans have permanent guaranteed access to VA health care due to exposure to Agent Orange. Current era veterans who are exposed need the same access for the same reasons. Um, and if I could, I'd like to illustrate this point by briefly telling you a story about a warrior named Scott Evans. Uh, Scott was a Marine. He deployed twice to Afghanistan as a combat engineer and as a dog handler um, where he was exposed to burn pits. Uh, he says that they were even encouraged to spend time near the burn pits with the dogs to see if uh, they could still sniff the munitions among the burning waste. So in other words, uh, the burn pits were used as a training area in his case. Um, eventually, he was honorably discharged in 2012. Uh, he got a job. He never felt the need to enroll in VA medical care um, or uh, put in a disability claim because he felt that he suffered no significant disabilities. Uh, it wasn't until eight years later in the spring of 2020 that he started experiencing severe abdominal pain uh, and losing weight rapidly. And at that point, he knew something was wrong. 
tried to enroll at his local VA, but he learned that he was not eligible since he never filed a claim uh, and he was beyond the five-year enhanced eligibility period for combat veterans. Over the course of the next several months, uh, Scott accumulated about $20,000 in medical bills seeking diagnosis and treatment for his condition. Um, and it wasn't until later that year that a friend that he served with connected into Wounded Warrior Project. We were able to get him service connected, um, not for his toxic exposure uh, illness, but for uh, other things and enrolled at the VA. But his diagnosis at that point, several months later, was terminal pancreatic cancer. Um, Scott says that he's received good care since he's been enrolled, but understandably, he can't help but wonder if his cancer would have been, would have been operable um, if it was caught months sooner when he initially tried to enroll. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we believe no veteran who served in an area of known exposure should ever be turned away from the VA. Uh, unfortunately, Scott's not alone. We estimate there are as many as 750,000 Iraq and Afghanistan veterans who are currently ineligible for VA healthcare enrollment due to the fact that they've been unable to establish a service-connected disability within five years of discharge. So that's 750,000 veterans who served in areas of known exposure who are now operating without a safety net should they become ill. And we don't think any of them should ever be turned away like Scott was. Uh, and so for this reason, we strongly believe that guaranteed access to care for all exposed veterans uh, in Title I of the Honoring Our PACT Act is absolutely critical and has to be part of any comprehensive toxic exposure solution this Congress. Uh, so once again, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to turn it back over to you at this point. Uh, well, thank you uh, for that testimony, Mr. Morosk. It was uh, very heart rendering to hear that uh, that that story. Uh, uh, I will now. Uh, yeah, I, I'll now ask the first question under Title One. Um, in Title One, uh, it's updating the definition of toxic exposure risk activity, uh, actual language. Uh, in the bill to mean any activity with an entry in the individual longitudinal exposure record or ILER, I-L-E-R, or other exposure records such as the defense occupational and environmental health readiness system, uh, a revision uh, everyone here could support. So is, is basically the definition something that, uh, that you all, that everybody here, minority members, majority members, VSO community advocates, can we live with this toxic exposure activity, risk activity definition to mean any activity with an entry in the ILER or the defense occupational and environmental health readiness system? Um, is this a revision that we can support or are there other concerns? Is there anybody who, can't support it, that might be the easier question, easier way to respond. Is there anybody here can't support this revised definition? All right, uh, I will take that as uh, a- Chairman, did, Yes, uh, go, go ahead, Alex, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, does this uh, revised definition also include the uh, dates and locations that are listed in, I believe it's section 302? This revised definition, I'm seeing my staff shake their heads no. Does not include the dates. Understood. That's something we should take note of. Well, we'll take that under discussion and so we don't have to get bogged down with that. I want to keep things moving. Uh, Mr. Vale, do you have a comment, Mr. Vale, on, on uh, Title I? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just I have a uh, concern about well, first off, I wanted to say BVA uh, supports this legislation. Um, but we also want to point out, you know, it's it's not good policy to overpromise and underdeliver. If this is not uh, done uh, correctly, we could run the risk of repeating the sins of the past. Um, a lot of good people, A lot of good people work at VA and their hands are, are far often um, tied due to resource limitations. Good legislative intent sometimes ends up with rulemaking that results in unintended consequences. VHA is operating at full capacity right now, that's our, our understanding, when considering the influx of new eligible veterans that this legislation will, will provide for, um, it would only seem natural that this is too great of a burden for VHA to bear unto itself. 
Consequently, this will fall on the community care networks to deliver these new, newly eligible veterans health care. Is this too great a burden for the community care networks to bear? Has the full cost to fund this additional uh, demand for health care uh, been considered? Uh, this is happening right now with the Defense Health Agency. Dependents on TRICARE are being sent out from the military treatment facilities to the community. Rural and remote providers are overloaded and cannot absorb more patients. How can they handle more patients such as these new veterans who are eligible under this legislation? Are we unintentionally creating a perfect storm? You know, giving somebody a benefit they can't access, um, that's, that's really frustrating. And so I ask, um, are we creating an, an underfunded mandate here? We support the legislation, but we're concerned about, about having adequate funding to support it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Bell. Uh, we definitely have noted your concerns and I think they're valid ones, uh, but let me go on to uh, ranking member Bost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is a question that I want to ask all of our BSOs and everybody that's involved uh, with Title I here. Would you agree that ad addressing eligibility for health care should be our first priority? And if everybody agrees, and I'll, but if you don't agree, let me know that. Okay, because that's going to lead to my second question. And, and then is, would you support a proposal that extends eligibility for care without expanding benefits while we continue to work on how to best proceed. So in other words, we're getting it the, 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 to the opening statement that I made, which is there's people that need the care now. So let's move forward with that, provide that at a level that we can, and then continue to work for the longer goal for this bill. Anybody disagree with that? Thank you, Member Bose. I just have a comment on that. Rosie Torres from Burn Pits 360. I think my concern with that is how well equipped is the VA to handle those complex patients coming in with, you know, these underlying diseases that up until now they're passing off as psychosomatic issues. They're diagnosing people with mental health issues as opposed to these underlying cancers that are killing veterans. And I'll give you an example. Uh, Sergeant Wesley Black, who was on um, John Stewart's show recently, uh, you know, he died and he was misdiagnosed. So my biggest, biggest concern would be what, what, what training would be facilitated to these clinicians? Are they trained in occupational medicine? Are they trained in epidemiology? There's so much that it takes to properly assess these kinds of health issues. That would be my only concern um, is, is, is I don't want to see what is happening now continue to happen. That's it, sir, respectfully. So, Thank you. so that, that's probably one of the reasons why it's so vitally important to get the input from the VA so we know where they are, what they can handle. And, but also, as I did, said in the opening statement uh, that was so, uh, so brought about in our last hearing, but while we're doing this, we're doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's not a good place to be. I mean, we can continue, we can chew gum and walk, okay? We can do this and provide for those that have and can be diagnosed and still continue to work on the legislation rather than, you, you understand what I'm saying? That's the concern I have. Well, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. I understand this. I have, I, Mr. Brown, uh, Ron Brown, I, I understand you have a response. Yes. Uh, or comment, comment. Yeah, I'm sorry. Representative Boss, a uh, question I have uh, would be, what about the people who have the terminal cancers and uh, they're unable to work? How would the compensation, I mean, where would it come from? Well, that's what I'm saying. We can continue to work to try to get that done as quick as possible too. But the, the, but the, situation is we do know those that are exposed. We do know those that need the medical treatment that they can receive right now. We can move forward with getting that part out and be taken care of and then continue. We do that with legislation every day. We, we, that's how we create legislation quite often is we move forward knowing that we can definitely positively do this and then let's keep working to try to get it better and better and better. But right now we're not doing anything. 
okay, in respects to the Eiler system, is that going to go back to cover the earlier veterans before 9-11 with the known exposures that the VA has on their website already, or is that just solely for the post 9-11 veterans? Uh, Mr. Brown, my understanding is, is that the, uh, the Isler would, would address the post 9-11 veterans, not pre-9-11 veterans. That's, so that's um, the Isler is a system that's still, it's, it's actually being created now. It's, it's something that's being done now. It's, I don't think we have uh, we don't think we have data for pre 911 vets. So uh, okay, uh, chairman, I understand what you're saying. The uh, the VA already has the known exposures listed on the Office of Public Health for the previous deployments before 911, and that's what I was wondering if those would be added into the ILR system. They they are planning. They are that is. Um, that is that is in the, that is also sort of being contemplated now. And to answer your question, is uh, that is the intention? I do want to move on, keep this moving. Uh, to uh, uh, next, uh, who put up her hand was uh, Ms. Flocken. Go ahead, Ms. Flocken. Uh, title one. Um, I appreciate everyone being here today, and I think everybody wants to do the right thing and make sure that the burn pits of the, particularly the post 9/11 generation isn't, you know, doesn't live through the same experience that our Vietnam vets who were exposed to Agent Orange went through, where it was years and years and studies and just demands on their time to make their case in the VA while people died from exposure. We're trying to avoid repeating recent history. Um, and I appreciate everyone um, being here. I, you know, I have a, a part of the, the bill that we're considering Peter Meyer, Representative Peter Meyer and I did the um, burn Pit Exposure Act, just to make it easier and to have some presumption when you walk in. Um, and I know, you know, obviously it costs money to treat people who have been exposed to these things. I think we all know, know deep down that it's part of our responsibility. And I would just note for my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who are so worried about the money, all but one of you voted for the $25 billion increase to the defense budget. So it, just to be consistent here, if you're gonna be deeply, deeply concerned about the spending of money, I would expect the same scrutiny to a bill you passed and voted on um, in December that we are now giving to helping our veterans. Um, I, I would just ask Rosie, if you could um, just from your experience, you know, I think it's sometimes hard when you do policy to just, uh, you sort of lose your ability to understand what this means for human beings. And I know your experience through your husband was really powerful when I heard it. Talk about his experience of trying to make his case and what it means so that this committee understands what our veterans are going through every day just to get that recognition. Oh, I mean, look, it th and thank you so much to all of you for this opportunity. Um, it was, it, it's, it was years and years. I mean, I worked at the VA for 23 years, so I sort of understood, you know, the red tape we were, we were, we were about to face. Um, but it, it was just years and years of delay on both the Department of Defense side and the Department of Veteran Affairs side. So we, we, we basically went to every healthcare facility within the two systems. I mean, to prove a point, and then most importantly, to try and get answers, right? But I already knew the outcome was going to be even traveling over the war related illness and injury center. And in between that, we had nonprofit organizations, you know, filling the gap financially because we had already exhausted our life savings. In my husband's case, it was more of us being forced to find an answer because his employer was getting ready to let him go. Right. He was a state police in the state of Texas. Um, and then they forced him to resign after we finally were able to uh, receive a, a solid diagnosis from Dr. Robert Miller over at Vanderbilt University. Prior to that, every answer was just basically a diagnosis of unknown etiology, anxiety. You know, it was very frustrating. So we knew um, that, that we weren't the only family experiencing this hardship. Um, and so after you exhaust all your life savings and trying to access care, which we're sort of still sort of there, he was recently hospitalized 
for the same issues as the gentleman that Alex Morosky talked about. We don't know if he's got pancreatic cancer. It's a huge possibility. Um, but you know, the challenges that these families face, aside from trying to access care, is you hear story after story of, of these survivors, widows, uh, spending their last days with their loved one, trying to collect buddy statements from their loved ones, uh, you know, brothers and sisters during wartime, just to try and figure out how will I put food on the table for my children once my loved one is gone. Um, and, and we know that's being done on a case by case basis, but that's not enough. I mean, it's, it, it's very scary to, to, to even think about, you know, going to the VA um, because even their own staff tells us if you have TRICARE, go on the outside, it'll take forever. And now this is their own staff telling, in, in making these kinds of uh, advice and encouragement. So, I mean, while I know the VA is working on things, the reality is that in, in this community of people impacted, you know, there's neither the presumption nor the healthcare happening. You know, um, I know veterans that have uh, walked into appointments and they leave hopeless. You know, I don't know how many people have put a bullet in their head because they're so hopeless at the end of the day, they're losing their homes, they're losing their vehicles, they're losing their jobs. So much so that, and I'll end with this, you know, the injustice behind all of this continues on to like where we are as my family today. Leroy's uh, job loss is will now be heard before the United States Supreme Court because it's not okay to treat the veterans the way they're being treated. So, you know, I just encourage everyone to understand it from every perspective that, you know, not only as a family, but as an organization, we've collected data. There are people in everyone's districts coming forward and saying the same thing. So thank, thank you. you, Congressman Slotkin, for- Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you, Rosie. Uh, Mr. Stewart, um, I understand you have uh, something to say. Yeah, thanks so much. I, I just wanted to zoom out for a second. You know, as we're all talking about you know, different funding and different bureaucratic fixes to just get a, a larger perspective on, on what the reality of this should probably be. You know, the VA is instituting another bureaucratic process to decide if there are certain conditions which might meet the protocol and criterion that they're working to establish to make sure uh, that a veteran in what is generally seen by the community as an adversarial process can tie the toxic exposure that he experienced in Iraq and Afghanistan to the conditions uh, th that they're suffering now. And we wanna talk about, do we have enough money? There really should be one job here and one job alone. And that is how do we implement first rate toxic exposure healthcare for our Iraq and Afghanistan veterans so that they can receive in the way that the VA and, and DOD have gotten better with traumatic brain injury and PTS. Man, if you went down to Walter Reed in 2004, you'd have the, the, the adaptive rehabilitation there was two double amputees lying on a mat, throwing a medicine ball back and forth. And if you go in there now, it is world-class. They have the world-class corrective surgeries. They have world-class prosthetics. They have world-class technology and adaptive rehabilitation, but it took intention and it took money. And we have to establish that for the veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan because a toxic wound is an IED that goes off in your body five years later, 10 years later, 15 years later. And yet the burden of proof and scrutiny is always on the veteran. And so respectfully, when we talk about, hey, we just wanna get them into healthcare now, access to a system that doesn't understand toxic exposure doesn't help anybody. There's a burn pit center for excellence at the VA. Its funding is six to $7 million a year. That's in 2022, 15 years after the DOD and the VA knew that this storm was coming. To give you just a, a, a perspective on that, they spend $90 million a year on Viagra. If a budget is uh, a list of your priorities, I think that shows where everything stands. So when I hear everybody say, well, we've got to get it right. Here's the problem with the VA. They're afraid of being overwhelmed. The only conversation we should be having 
is a collaborative effort to bring the VA together and create first rate toxic exposure healthcare and not healthcare first and benefits later, because if you're uh, sick with pancreatic cancer, not having your benefit, what are you living on? So the idea that we need to split everything up and do it piecemeal and create more bureaucratic processes on this is unacceptable. The bottom line is this, our country exposed our own veterans to poison for years and we knew about it and we didn't act with urgency and appropriateness. And therefore we've lost men and women who serve this country. They've died out of our inaction. And so I just wanna step back for a second and don't worry so much about the protocol for a new disease and the things like that. Let's not lose the big picture because I know everybody here wants to do the right thing and it's really appreciated. I just don't wanna get lost in the sauce here. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, uh, John. Uh, I have uh, in the queue the following members, uh, uh, Miller Meeks, Luria, Levin, and Trone. We are now out of time for Title I, but I'm gonna take one more, I'm gonna take uh, Ms. Miller Meeks's question for uh, Title I. I will keep uh, Ms. Luria, Mr. Levin, Mr. Trone in the queue for uh, the discussion on Title II. You can go back to Title I, but I, we gotta keep this moving. So. Uh, Ms. Miller Meeks, uh, uh, you have your opportunity to make a comment on Title I or whatever. Uh, thank you, Chair Takano, and uh, thank you, Ranking Member Boston, to all, all of our panelists are presenting. So, this question comes from uh, being a 24 year military veteran and family members who are veterans, an uncle who spent his entire life uh, in a VA facility after his ship went down in the Pacific in World War II, um, and, and also as a physician. And I have a, a friend who um, developed cardiomyopathy uh, after Desert Storm, which impacted both the life of he and his wife and, and us, of, of course, as his friends. And so my concern is this, there is a, a tremendous healthcare shortage. It's not only at the VA hospital, I know one of the bills we may be voting on will be on trying to alleviate some of that, but all across this country, I represent a rural district. Uh, there are healthcare shortages, there are personnel shortages, there are specialist shortages. And so I think it's a valid uh, point to bring up that, um, and, I, and I think Mr. Vale mentioned this, that saying that someone has a benefit doesn't get them healthcare, it only gets them a benefit. So, you know, is there a possibility and could we envision a phased in um, approach to healthcare access for toxic exposed veterans as we continue to de determine the science on whether or not a toxic exposure is truly related to an organic health care problem or disease. That's it. I'm respecting my time. Okay. Well, thank you. If there's no response, we'll move on to Title II. Uh, uh, thank you, Ms. Miller -Meeks. Uh, I uh, uh, For Title II, the uh, discussion, um, let me just go to my question here. For Title II. Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, Mr. Murray, that's the process. Mr. Murray, you're now recognized to begin our discussion on Title II, toxic exposure presumption process. Mr. Murray, you're recognized uh, for your remarks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Boss, for getting everyone together. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on uh, this important subject. Uh, comprehensive tax exposure reform is the VFW's number one legislative goal for the 117th Congress. Uh, we're confident that with this many people all pulling in the same direction, we can finally accomplish that goal. Uh, one of the most common issues we've heard from countless VFW members is the difficulty in getting care and benefits for illnesses uh, believed to be due to tax exposure. Um, military service is synonymous with tax exposure. Decades, decades since World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Iraq, Afghanistan, and other places around the world, it's synonymous with service. But unfortunately, the burden of proof has been put too heavily on the individual veterans for decades, and it's far past time to revamp that process. A major step in it, in the process, is updating how presumptives are granted. And VA is currently undergoing a pilot program, which 
hopefully will improve the process and make it considerably easier for veterans to be granted toxic exposure presumptives. Uh, we're encouraged by the willingness of Secretary McDonough to update and revise the process. We're hopeful that the end result will be something that we're all in favor of. However, uh, the VFW does have some serious concerns about some of the specific details of that pilot program. Um, we've been engaged by VA and we have to keep those lines of communications open in order to achieve success. Uh, but that's the whole point of a pilot program is to hammer out what works, what doesn't, and hopefully produce a great product that works for veterans. Uh, the next important step is rev in revising the presumptive process is codifying what works. The VFW is supportive of many of uh, the pieces of legislation that strive to set in place a new framework for toxic exposure presumptives. And there are parts of different bills that we think would get the job done right. The TEAM Act, for example, proposes an independent commission that is outside of VA. Even if we had full faith and confidence in the current situation at VA to do all the right thing, we've seen time and time again, VA secretaries fail to solve this problem due to varying issues. The VFW believes there should be an element of an independent body in the overall process. In the PACT Act, it calls for internal VA commissions. We believe there is a critical role for that, but not only to have internal VA commissions or boards. We believe a combination of both is the best path forward. Additionally, the PACT Act proposes a specific timeline for officially accepting or declining the recommendations of the varying boards. This is critical because far too long studies and reports have waited on decisions for years, all the while veterans were getting sick and dying. We're hopeful to continue this process today and every day for the remainder of the 117th Congress. Uh, we may have differing opinions on about how the end product should look regarding tax exposure presumptives, but the one thing I believe we can all agree on is the current process is broken and it's not helping veterans to the fullest extent. And we need to do something to fix it. I'm glad we're all here today to make that happen. Thank you very much for the time. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, uh, I, I, well, thank you uh, Mr. Uh, Learman for the, uh, uh, Mr. Murray, Mr. Murray, for your comment uh, on Title II. Uh, I'll go to my question. Uh, VA, VA suggests that our proposed approach to the toxic exposure presumption process outlined in Section 202 uh, that would add more complexity to the process and further delay answers that veterans are currently seeking on toxic exposures. They request that we strike this new framework. However, at the same time, VA is actively developing their own new framework for presumptions. Uh, there is nothing in place to prevent this secretary or the next secretary from changing or eliminating it. By putting the requirements in law, we ensure the framework remains in place for future generations of toxic exposed veterans. Does everyone agree on this point? If not, why not? I invite uh, feedback at this point on Title II and this question of putting a framework into law. Mr. Chairman, the uh, frankly, the assertion that this would delay it any further is flat out wrong. I don't know how you delay never getting something done. Toxic exposure is not getting done in any way, shape or form in any kind of speedy fashion. So this is not going to delay it. Um, you can't delay something which isn't being done. Uh, this would put it in law, hopefully, again, this we have uh, differing feelings about exactly specifics. VA's presumptive pilot process is different than what we're talking about today. Um, I think what VA did in rolling out a pilot without bringing in everybody ahead of time, uh, simply producing, here's what we're doing. Um, we hope everybody gives it a thumbs up. That's not the best way to do it. We would prefer to get brought in in order to form that. So we don't waste time and then going back for a version two or version three, so on and so forth. Um, no, I, I do not think uh, that it would delay it. It's necessary. We've got to do something to make it speedy. Uh, Secretary McDonough said that there's a perceived uh, level of denial with toxic exposure. That's not perceived. That's a reality. Right now, they're denying about 80%. Um, we we got to get that. We got to get that entirely flipped around. So. Uh, whatever efforts we can do to actually get something on the books that works, that's what needs to happen. Well, thank you, Mr. Murray. Um, Mr. Ross, get a quick response. 
Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, we appreciate the fact that um, the VA is uh, doing its own pilot program to have a framework. We agree that a framework is uh, going to be necessary in any event, but it's also going to have to be codified uh, in any event. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Butler. Roscoe Butler, I think you had your... He's not saying anything. Oh, Mr. Uh, no, Mr. I had something in regard to Title I. Uh, you can go ahead and say something in Title I. That's fine. Uh, I, I was just going to say that um, I agree that it's important that we, we don't uh, put benefits and health care at odds with one another. But we, but something needs to be done immediately because veterans are not getting the benefits that they deserve. It shouldn't be uh, whether we have the resources to provide the care or services. It should be what is the right way to provide the benefits that they deserve today and move forward in ensuring that uh, I'd like the provision in Title One that uh, uh, provides for uh, a report on whether uh, VA has the resources and, um, and necessary to meet the needs of the section, and if not, to provide a report to Congress on what that is. That allows the framework for VA to get the resources, uh, the adequate resource needed to provide a full continuum of benefits, healthcare benefits to veterans. But we shouldn't uh, delay it to uh, put the one benefit at odds with the other. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Butler. Uh, we do need to move on to Ranking Member Boss. Mr. Ranking Member Boss, go ahead. Thank you. And, and, and as we're trying to work through this, I just need to know, you know, what the VSOs believe, what, what's the scientific standard that, should, that Congress should put in place for VA to establish the new pr uh, presumptions of exposure? And then this, a second question I have too, and, and anybody can answer either one of these, but do you believe the VA pilot program, uh, that, that the VA pilot program will establish uh, the presumptions of exposure, will increase transparency, transparency and improve the process with, with what we're doing right now with the pilot program? Ranking Member Boss, the scientific standard the VFW believes to be positive association, uh, not causation. Um, that was one of the uh, initial sticking points in the first draft, I guess, of the pilot program. VA has gone back and revised that. We're, we're grateful that they're listening. Um, more transparency? We certainly hope so. Um, as we, we saw on uh, Mr. Stewart's show, uh, it was very difficult to explain a, a presumptive process. There were a couple of smart individuals in that room and it really sounded like it was very difficult. So how do we explain it to our members who, who don't do this every single day? They feel like they're going like they're going against an adversarial um, process. So that's the biggest thing. We, we hope it's transparent. We hope it's easy to understand and we hope it gets veterans the care and benefits they need. Rep, boss. Ms. Birch, Ms. Birch, go ahead and then I'll call on Mr. Brown. Uh, yes, um, I agree with everyone that they what they've said so far, but uh, <clears throat> the big thing is that we need to remove the burden of proof from the veteran and remember that because me personally, it took me seven years to get my disability approved for toxic exposure. It took over six ER trips and thousands of dollars later that I'll never get that money back, but thankfully I have the medical care. And in that seven years, uh, that nodule that was in my lung doubled in size. And now every year I have to go get screened to make sure it doesn't turn into cancer. And I think we need to keep the veteran in the forefront of this conversation. And that right now we have veterans that are dying. We have veterans that are just finding out that they have health impacts from toxic exposure. And we have future veterans that don't even know what's to come in their future. And so I think the presumptions here is that we need to make sure we look at the Vietnam veterans and what their presumptions are because there's a lot of similarities there, what the Gulf War veterans have been experiencing and bring in a panel of maybe non-VA doctors. For example, you have the National Jewish Health in Denver, Colorado with some of the top 
pulmonologists in the world and you bring them in, you sit down and you, you take a look at some of these cases and decide what are these top presumptions that are going to be. And so that we can start removing that burden of proof. So for example, myself and other veterans, I have to be my own lawyer, my own medical advisor, my own advocate, put everything together in the most organized way to submit it to the VA in hopes that they would approve it. And thankfully I was part of that 20%, but 80% of us are still not getting those benefits. And in the meantime, there are veterans that are dying like Sergeant Wesley Black. All right, thank you very much. Real quickly, Mr. Brown. Yes, uh, Rep. Boss, I can show you approximately 20 to 30 years worth of National Academy reports on Gulf War and health that they have illnesses like acute leukemia and aplastic anemia in its highest category of a, a, of a casual or, or association, the VA has never added any of these. And they're the ones who contract it through the National Academy of Medicine to do the studies. And there's hundreds of conditions like that in those volumes, but none of those have ever been added as a presumptive under the VA. All right, well, thank you. I, I do want to, to uh, uh, Ms. Mr. Levin, Mr. Levin, go ahead. Talk thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening this roundtable, and, and thanks to our VSO leaders, thanks to our other guests. Uh, my question is for uh, both Pat Murray and for John Stewart, uh, and uh, it seems obvious that everybody here wants to do the right thing, uh, but only some want to pay. Uh, for what is the right thing. And, and so my question is, what message does it send to our service members and to our veterans if we dismiss the comprehensive reform that we need due to the cost, due to the cost of, of doing what is so obviously the right thing? Uh, and what do you think this says about our values as a nation? Uh, Mr. Levin, I, I think the, the pay for for all this was our plane tickets overseas. Um, that's what paid for uh, this, this care and benefits. Uh, there's far too many people that raised the right hand to go do whatever it was. And there was no consideration at the time uh, for, you know, how we're gonna, you know, what tax is gonna be used for this 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Unfortunately, you know, from, from many of Mr. Brown's folks in that area, that was 50 years later, 60 years later. So that kind of stuff's completely unacceptable. The cost of war is exactly what this is. This is just a continuation. This is phase two of it. Uh, this, is, this is the next step. This is critical uh, to, to put together with the total cost of being in the military. Mr. Learman, do you have a response or comment? Oh, no, actually, I, Mr. I, Mr. Chairman, I was actually interested in Mr. Stewart's thoughts on this as well. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I, I would say simply this. It's we are a country that loves its veterans, or certainly we, we purport to. And we support the troops and we put on our flag pins and we stand and they get discounts at Denny's. But the true support of having a veteran's back is, is when they need the support. And when they are sick and dying due to uh, the service that they gave to this country and they come back and are put under scrutiny and are made to be defendants in a case concerning their own health care and lives, it's unacceptable. And it's the lowest hanging fruit of a functioning society. And so much of this is just pure common sense. And if we could just stand back for a moment outside of the bureaucratic impact of all this, and, and stop thinking about the process by which I would challenge every congressional leader in this uh, room today or on this call, go back to your district and dig a 10 acre pit and put everything that that town discards into that pit and burn it with jet fuel and diesel fuel and put in hazardous materials. For God's sakes, the burning uh, the smoking gun in this case is literally smoking guns. And then burn that pit 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But tell your constituents, don't worry, 15 years from now, we're going to convene a panel to discuss whether or not the health issues 
that you're having are in your head or not. And we're going to make you get a lawyer to prove it. Look, we've got all these diseases lined up. Ground zero in Manhattan is a burn pit, was a burn pit. The men and women who sat on that pile and dug through it suffered the very same illnesses and diseases that we are seeing now. We've created a program through John Field and this drug act with the, uh, not, it's, it's administered by NIOSH and the Department of Justice. It is effective, it is targeted, it uh, deals with prevention and screening and healthcare. These programs exist. You don't need to reinvent the wheel and we shouldn't have blinders on to this idea that this process and these diseases We've not been allowed to use burn pits in the United States since the 1970s. The EPA has already gone through the list of cancers and immune issues and, and pulmonary issues and lung issues. Why are we relitigating this? When thousands and thousands of veterans, their very lives depend on the urgency of your actions. So that's my thought. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Uh, we do need to move on, and we have. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Learman to uh, be the last uh, comment on the Title II section. So, Mr. Learman, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity today. I think the big thing to point out in reference to some of the conversations about presumptions and codifying it and waiting for VA, VA say it takes too long. There are many examples. Uh, we can look at Agent Orange and Vietnam veterans. In 2016, there were several diseases associated with that exposure. However, it took you, an act of Congress, to get them passed because VA didn't get it done. So any process that we go forward must be transparent. VA must include the VSOs, and it should be codified. So we're protected from secretaries or administrations that aren't going to take that action in the future. All right, well, thank you. Thank you that for Mr. Lerman. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, Title III and uh, Mr. Trone and Mr. Geigel, you're in the queue as members. Um, so I, I thank uh, uh, you all for the discussion on Title II. Mr. Lerman, you're now going to uh, uh, lead our discussion on Title III, uh, which is about improving the establishment of service connection for toxic exposed veterans. So go ahead and read your com or go ahead and present your comments for Title III. Thank you, Chairman. Appreciate it. Uh, Title III establishes a presumption of exposure, uh, also known as a concession of exposure. What does this mean? This means that VA will concede exposures as identified in Eilers and those determined by the VA secretary to include roughly 50 different toxins in 17 countries as related to burn pit exposure. Uh, these are, were already identified in air sampling reports by the United States Army. And also VA currently recognizes those toxins as well. So by establishing this concession of exposure, what are we doing? We're removing the veterans, we're, we're removing their burden of proof. They don't have to prove what they were exposed to. This concession of exposure will concede. If they were there, here's what they were exposed to. Right now, 78% of claims for direct service connection on conditions related to burn pits are being denied. This can help change that by conceding, yes, they were exposed. And let's take it a step further. It will also require VA to provide a medical opinion and an examination if there is not sufficient evidence for them to grant that on a direct service connection. Why is this so important? Well, let's say we don't have presumptive diseases yet. This removes those obstacles for veterans to get direct service connection. Now, let's say we do have presumptive diseases, but this veteran has one not on the list. This will help them get direct service connection. So this is a huge part of the bill. DAV fully supports this because you're giving veterans a fighting chance, whether there's a presumptive disease, a presumptive list, and more importantly, it's removing those obstacles to get what they need to get service connection and they don't have to prove their exposure. 
Now, real quick, I, I just want to comment on a few of the other things we've talked about. One, I, I am disappointed to hear that the health care in Title I, uh, the proposal would exclude the veterans listed under Title III, which be, would be veterans exposed to burn pits from the first Persian Gulf and from post 9-11 toward now. These are veterans in, in many rights, no longer have that five-year access. They no longer have health care. So I think that amendment really misses the mark. And if we're only going to rely on Eilers, Eilers only goes back so many years. This is not going to catch everybody, even the entire post 9-11 generation. So I think we shouldn't put all our eggs in that basket. And then one, one last final comment on how do we pay for all this? Pay, go, cut, go. Why do veterans have to pay for their own benefits? Why do we have to cut programs inside the Veterans Affairs from one group of veterans to pay for these groups of veterans now just to get health care, to get service connection, to get benefits? We don't have to. We choose to. It's a self-imposed rule. We could waive that. We could find ways to do this. And, and DAV really believes pay, go, cut, go should not apply to veterans' benefits. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Chairman Takano and Ranking Member Bost, greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Lerman. Um, I'm gonna uh, go straight into uh, uh, my question uh, for Title III. Uh, when it comes to improving the establishment of service connection process for toxic exposed veterans, VA states that the use of ILER is premature since it is not an authoritative source of exposure information in the moment. Um, but is this a valid reason to not codify the use of either at this time? Wouldn't we want the intent of its use firmly established for when the platform is fully operational? Uh, so if there's any feedback from our VSOs or members uh, to the questions I just asked, please. Yes, uh, Chairman. Uh, just, just ahead, to, Mr. Lemon, go ahead. Just to address that real quick, I think Eiler has potential, right? There is great potential in Eilers going forward. But again, it's not complete. And if we codify it too soon, I'm just saying potentially, VA may then say, well, your exposure wasn't in Eiler, so you weren't exposed, you're denied your benefits. We want to make sure we don't get to that point. Now, codifying it now for the future, there's nothing wrong with that. We just don't wanna go down the path of, if it's not an Eiler, it didn't happen because we all know there are 40, 50, 60 years worth of toxic exposures that nobody's ever gonna know. They're not in any military records. They'll never show up in Eiler. So we don't wanna limit veterans by solely relying on Eilers. I hear you. All right, um, why don't we go to Ranking Member Bost? Ranking Member Bost? Thank you, just real quick. So, so anybody want input on, can give input here. What's the most effective way to determine whether the service member was exposed to toxins at a specific location? What would be that criteria that we'd set for the future? Ranking Member Boss, we've gone through this round and round with generations of the past. Uh, originally folks uh, that were in Vietnam were only given it between certain years and certain latitudes and they expanded to the brown water, then the blue water. There's still folks that have been exposed to it in Thailand, Cambodia, uh, Guam, who don't have it. So trying to piecemeal it out isn't working. Again, uh, exposure is synonymous with service. We've got a lot of reports of people on bases. We're not even talking about that. People in Hawaii right now are drinking gasoline. That's terrible. We're not even talking about that in the PACT Act. So there's domestic uh, exposures as well. So military service uh, is really what we're really starting to look towards as synonymous with exposure. Outside of the individual service member having monitors, wearing, measuring everything they breathe, everything that they're doing over there, there's no way to truly track the, the, the exposure dose that an individual had. That's a problem that earlier generations faced. They didn't have any of those measurements to keep track of the exposure. So therefore the VA doesn't think that those troops were exposed and it takes so long for them to finally get around to saying, well, you may have, 
or like seven years later for uh, our Desert Storm veterans when the DOD sent out letters about chemical exposure. And, you know, by that time, most of those people who were sick were already out of service. Then they're trying to get their claims approved and the VA is looking at them like there's nothing there. And let, let me just say this, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work with everybody on this panel and understand that. But what, what you've just said is, if you serve, you automatically get it, regardless of where you're at, what you were exposed to, anything like that. That changes the whole process by what we're trying to work on here, because we've got to try to get something that will pass through Congress, which means we have to have some guidelines set forth. I may even totally agree with you, but trying to get a majority of my colleagues to do the same, we're just beating a dead horse if we don't come up with a criteria that's set forth because that is the standard that's been there. And, and if it's going to be that if you sign the dotted line, you became a member of the military, no matter where you went, you automatically get these benefits, then that's something that we need to look at. But I don't know how you're going to get it through and passed. Okay. I understand that, that difficulty. What, and what I just uh, outlined, uh, Mr. Boss, was basically everyone, everywhere, at all times. Uh, but that, what, we're, what we're trying to do is get it focused where it needs it the most. But I do also want to identify that, frankly, there are other things that we're, we're not talking about. We, we are focusing uh, a lot on burn pits. There's a lot of other exposures, like the men and women that were sure. at K2 that were like at a weapons dump. Right. Um, you know, so what I'm trying to identify is like, this is a very pervasive problem uh, throughout the entire military. So when it seems adversarial at VA, it should absolutely not be adversarial. It should be a slam dunk. It should just be given that if someone comes in and says, I was exposed, the answer should be, you bet you were. Mm -hmm. well, you should just remember, boss, if I could, if I could just add to, yeah. if you look at the National Academy uh, of Science Studies, in which they would say, we can't draw a conclusion about exposure to burn pits and the conditions uh, that we're seeing, even within those studies, what they really say is, we have insufficient data. Right. A lot of the problem here is the Pentagon and DOD don't have the sufficient data and that time has passed. So there's no way to really create a cohort study. The, the closest thing we have to it, to go back to 9-11 is, we got really fortunate in that the FDNY had a cohort study that they had been doing prior to 9-11. So they had a perfect lineup of the data of exposure versus the, the pre-data. By the, the Pentagon's own admission, the data that they have is insufficient and it will never become sufficient. And so what we're doing is we're holding up veterans' healthcare and benefits based on data that the Pentagon hasn't been able to provide. And that will never get better. Right. So that's, mm -hmm. that, I think that's the catch-22 that we've placed the veterans in because now they're forced to go in and prove their own case. Sir, even if you smoked for 20 years, if you got lung cancer and a, a doctor and a medical board tried to make you prove that your lung cancer came from smoking, somebody could always come in and say, well, you lived in a city and you breathed in smog. We have to start living by the code of the VA, which is the veteran gets the benefit of the doubt. It's not causation. It's, it's not even correlation. So that, I think that's the issue that we get into as you start to try and define it, which is why I think all the VSOs are talking about presumption being the one thing that can lift that burden of proof because the data doesn't actually exist. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Uh, Mr. Geiger, I know you've been waiting, but Mr. Trone is back. Mr. Trone, uh, quickly, you can, uh, is, are you still here, Mr. Trone? Or did you leave? If, I'm uh, here, Chairman Chicano. So go ahead, you hear me? Mr. Trone. Thank you. I think the veteran gets the benefit. That's the hits the nail on the head. End of story. Uh, thank you for including the Fast and Presumptions Act in the bill uh, to get rid of barriers to care and move this process forward. Um, two points in business. You know, we always took care of our people, and I sit on this committee and also the Veterans Appropriations Committee where this is going. And, you know, we know how crucial it is to health care and taking care of our people while our people are our vets. So I love to hear uh, from 
uh, Mr. Stewart, if we could, on two quick points. One is the human cost that he's talked about a little bit on not getting this legislation done. That's the cost. Every day, there's a human cost of not having it done. And the second point is 18 months. Is that enough time for the VA to implement? We got a COVID vaccine and way less. Can we do this? Unless I think we should. I'd love to hear from Mr. Stewart. Lives are at stake every day. Uh, sir, I mean, what I would say is I think we also have to start looking at it as a, a national security issue. And I think when you when you look at how easily defense budgets go through and the amount of money that's being spent and the trillions of dollars that we have spent to try and rebuild countries overseas while ignoring uh, a lot of the pressing issues here, I think you see that you know, our veterans need to know that when they come home, they won't be discarded. Staff Sergeant Isaiah James, who's an infantryman and served in Iraq and Afghanistan, said something to me that I think should, should rock all of us to our core. And he said, if another country was doing to our veterans what we are doing to our veterans, we would be at war. And that, that's just, a, it's a chilling statement from someone who was boots on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan and is a young man who has seen a lot of his colleagues sick and die and a government that seems relatively inactive and, and uncaring and not moving. And as far as uh, uh, what the Congressman said about the amount of time for implementation, that should be our entire conversation here. The entire conversation should be, again, how do we implement first class toxic exposure, healthcare and prevention and benefits for those who have served? end of story. It, it's a, it, we can simplify this if we just keep our eye on, on the larger picture. But man, you know, Sergeant Wesley Black, who Rosie brought up earlier, he said in a heartbreaking way, it's too late for me, but I'm going to spend my last uh, time here on earth advocating for others so that what happened to me doesn't happen to any other of my brothers and sisters. And when I go to meet my maker, I'll be able to stand proud. And sadly, he did. Uh, unfortunately, just a, a little while ago, he passed. But, you know, we're losing the battle for hearts and minds of our own veteran community. And, and that's unacceptable for a country that speaks so highly of their veteran community and purports uh, to, to love them so much. And, and man, you know, here's the crazy part. It's so doable and it's so within reach, within intention and collaboration. And that's what's missing. The VA shouldn't be separate from this process. They shouldn't, this should just be about a collaboration. What the VA should be doing is coming to Congress and saying, here are the weak spots in our healthcare system. Here's how we think we can bolster it. Here are the resources we need to do that. And let's move forward together in it. It, it, it can be done. Uh, thank you. Every day it's too late for one more mom and one more dad. Uh, so we got to have a sense of urgency and trust our veterans. They trusted us when they went to war for us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Trone. Uh, Mr. Gallego, you've been waiting patiently. Thank you. And I apologize. I, I have another markup. That's why I, I just want to speak a little... Look, and I, I tell you this from my personal experience, I am, you know, part of this burn pit community. Uh, I live next to one for too long in Iraq. And, uh, you know, I feel like I'm a ticking time bomb. I already have seen friends, young men that have cancer, uh, brain cancer, different types of cancers, rare cancers, and the fact that we're all getting it. Uh, you know, I do feel, I feel scared. I mean, honestly, that, you know, every time I go for a checkup, that something is going to be found there. And it does piss me off that we're hearing about how we're going to pay for this. No one told me anything when I got sent to Iraq in 2005. They just told me, get on the plane and do what the country's asking for you, and we'll take care of you in return. And while I was there, or at least while we were there, this country gave a tax cut to the richest Americans in the country. So if you want to figure out how to pay for, the, for us men and women that you know, sacrifice our health, our youth, our lives, basically, for this country, then why don't you rescind those tax cuts that were put there while I was at war? taking in rounds and unfortunately now potentially exposed to burn pits uh, and the cancers and the diseases that may come uh, from that. 
Uh, there is plenty of money. There was plenty of money uh, for us when we cut taxes a couple of years ago under Trump. There's plenty of money when we cut taxes under Obama. There's plenty of money uh, when we cut taxes under Bush uh, Jr. Uh, there is plenty of money to take care of us veterans uh, if we wanted to, if we wanted to prioritize. And I also want to point out, we will end up doing this anyway. This is the same thing that happened with Agent Orange. We ended up put, putting it off for so long that we ended up taking care of men and women at the end of their lives when it's actually more expensive. If we actually take care of the veterans on the front end, we could actually catch a lot of these diseases early on and actually manage them. Because I tell you right now, in the end, Congress is going to give in. It may be five years from now, but there's going to be five years of people that are being hurt and it's going to end up costing the VA more. So it makes no sense. Let's find the pay for. Uh, if we have to borrow, why not borrow? We seem to be able to borrow for tax cuts. That makes no difference uh, in that plan. Again, I yield back my time. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and the witnesses regarding this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gallego. Uh, Advai Tompi, uh, will be the final word on, on uh, this title. Mr. Tompi. Good afternoon, Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Boss, and members of the committee. The American Legion is very grateful for your commitment to ensure veterans suffering from illnesses caused by the toxics caused by the toxins during their service have access to this quality VA healthcare. My name is Advay Thampi, and I'm a legislative associate at the American Legion. From 2005 to 2010, I served in the United States Marine Corps as a crew chief on C-130s, deployed to Iraq in 2008 and Afghanistan in 2009 and 10 in support of the global war on terror. I've witnessed firsthand the near ubiquitous presence of burn pits in close proximity to where our troops slept, fought, and ate for over 20 years. Now, for decades, the Legion has advocated for veterans exposed to these toxins, such as Agent Orange, Gulf War-related hazards. The recent long-awaited passage of the Blue Water Navy Act was the result of years of advocacy, and it came in some cases 60 years after initial exposure to the veteran. The American Legion will support this new generation of veterans. They are coming home with illnesses and conditions caused by airborne toxins. That is a fact, period, full stop. And we have to act now. Um, we, we keep talking about these costs and these costs and like, like others have said, um, you know, nobody asks about these costs when we start the war. And this has to be considered a part of the cost of war. The VA has been reactionary. They have not always been at the forefront and leading on these. They wait for X amount of number of veterans to pass away from this exposure. And when that number reaches X amount, then they decide to act. From our perspective, that's very reactionary. The VA is not being proactive. And that's what we hope that together we can pass this comprehensive legislation that will allow for establishing presumptions of exposure by establishing a list of presumptive illnesses associated with exposure and creating this framework for a transparency that the VA can use to establish additional presumptive illnesses in the future. I think what we've all seen is we can't keep legislating one illness at a time. Thank you so much. All right, um, we'll now move on to the next title. Uh, the next title is going to be uh, uh, led by, uh, the, we'll have the opening uh, discussion, discussion opener led by Ms. Birch. Uh, you're recognized for to begin our discussion on Title IV, Presumptions of Service Connection. Thank you for having us today, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, Bose, and other community members. Uh, like I said before, I have a toxic exposure disability, um, so this issue is very important to me. IVA supports the entire bill to include the healthcare framework and presumption of service connection. The presumption piece is no less critical than the other components, and this piece will finally lift the burden on the veterans for proving his or her illnesses um, and deserve the approval of the VA. Um, the fact is, is that presumptions, presumptions help with preventative care and that it establishes better preventative care and what doctors can look for. And that preventative care can help catch those medical problems in the early stages. And therefore not only just saving a life, but saving money 
in the long run. You know, the war may be over on the battlefield, but the war of combating the health and wellness impacts of this battle has just begun. And the emergence of these impacts will become more visible as time goes on, just like it did for our Vietnam veterans and veterans from every other war, past, current, and future veterans. There's a battle at home to be fought to ensure those who volunteered to serve their country are taken care of no matter the cost. Again, the veteran at the forefront of the picture. We service members wrote a blank check to our nation and we're not asking for the same in return, only what is owed to us, the care and services needed to address the injuries we sustained while in service, those visible and invisible. We must not put any more lives in danger waiting for a bureaucratic system to catch up and the time is to act now for the sake of the current veterans, but also for our future veterans. Mr. Chairman, cost wasn't a driver when Congress and the White House sent us to war, so we shouldn't shy away from paying for what was incurred. Thank you, Ms. Birch. Um, I just wanted to inform the members, Mr. Lamb and Mr. Ruiz, you are in the queue after uh, ranking member myself uh, for discussion on Title IV as the members. Uh, uh, my first question to uh, you know, the group assembled here uh, is, let me just sort of uh, preface it. Uh, VA does not support our Agent Orange presumption expansions for Thailand, Guam, Laos, and Cambodia, stating that uh, these presumption expansions are inconsistent with DOD information. Do our, does our, do our, the VSOs present here agree with that assessment? No. Mr. Murray, VFW says no. Yeah, no, no, Chair, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, the evidence record does show Thailand did have Agent Orange experience at several installations through 1976, as well as Johnston Atoll, which is another location um, where we know Agent Orange was exposed. So no, we don't agree with VA either. So I, I see Mr. Learman. Thank you, Mr. Learman. I, I saw Mr. Brown uh, shake his head. Yeah, correct. VBA and VCS. A partner we work with in analyzing this legislation. Uh, we strongly agree uh, and support these expansions of covered veterans uh, in section uh, 403 of this legislation. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to move to Ranking Member Boss. Go ahead, Ranking Member Boss. Yeah, and I've just got one question because I'm going to listen to the conversation here, but, but how can the VA expand its research for on the health effects of burn pits exposure? How can, or, or do we just automatically put into this title these, these and then say don't expand it anymore, just accept these and then are we still looking or what do we, I'm, I'm trying to figure, you know, as we try to get this passed, as I said earlier, we, we've got to make sure that we have answers and, and, and just going ahead and writing the check is, is something that maybe we would all agree on this panel, but we still got to get it through everybody else. That's what I'm trying to figure out here. So, well, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Lerman, you, Mr. Lerman, I, uh, Mr. Lerman, who else wants to comment? Uh, well, I'll start with you, Mr. Lerman, go ahead. Well, I, I think part of it is VA can accept science outside of the National Academies and their own evidence. Absolutely, they can. It's actually even written into the statutes for Agent Orange exposure as well for undiagnosed illnesses and, and others. So I think looking at other places is a first great step. And then, to your point, finding a way to do some comprehensive studies on those who were exposed. That way we can add potentially more in the future if needed beyond what we have. But I think VA already has the authority to look outside of the National Academies, uh, they just need to exercise. Uh, you know, I, I did, Ms. Uh, Ms. Torres, I did see your comment in the chat about uh, the 9-11 model uh, being a good model to look at. Um, and I also wanna just clarify, in addition to either qualifications, the PACT Act would provide concession to airborne hazards uh, and access to healthcare for certain Gulf War and post 9-11 veterans based on dates and locations. So I just wanna clarify that. Uh, anything, anybody else wanna re respond to the ranking? 
I think, Ranking Member Boss, if I hear you correctly, if I hear you accurately, you're concerned that maybe these these presumptions kind of show up maybe as, as, as without rhyme or reason and somewhat arbitrary, like we just sort of plucking them out of the air, but I don't think that's the case. Um, I, 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 I didn't mean it that way, but as we're moving forward, we put these down and then, okay, what, what do we use for research? What standard do we put? How do we, how do we get uh, as, as we try to, uh, if we're not going down the path of saying what we that came up in the discussion earlier, that automatically when you're enlisted from here on out, you're going to be covered. That's just the way it is. We're going to assume that everybody was exposed. What are, what's the criteria we're going to use? How do we encourage the VA to use certain criteria? What, uh, you know, we don't want to go down the path of Blue Water Navy, and we don't want to go down the path of Agent Orange, and we don't want I, 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 I disagree with one person that said a while ago that it saved was saves the money by doing it earlier. It actually, unfortunately, with Blue Water Navy, it didn't it, 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 it wouldn't have saved them money by doing it earlier because they waited until two thirds of them died off before they were able to even provide the benefit. So that's not the way we want to do it either. So uh, well, I'm just trying to figure, the, you know. To, to well, Mr. Mr. Boss, if I could just if someone could chime in some of the, our, our, our VSO partners or other members. But what I recall is that the that the most prevalent respiratory presumptions had a lot of scientific basis to them from the from the academies, and the secretary has moved forward with three of the more prevalent respiratory uh, presumptions. The rare cancers, because they are rare uh, and they're happening in very young people, uh, that uh, I mean they're frankly not going to be, uh, they're not as prevalent because of the definition of they're being rare. Uh, so anyway, I want to move on to Mr. Lamb. Uh, Mr. Lamb, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to say one thing based on our recent experiences in this committee, um, and I was hoping maybe our witness from VBA could respond to this. Um, I represent a very large chapter of Vietnam veterans of America and have worked with them closely on the Agent Orange presumptions. And frankly, as, as someone that's 37 years old, I was shocked when I got to Congress and found out that we were still trying to establish new Agent Orange presumptions almost 50 years or more than 50 years in some cases after the exposure took place. Um, the post 9-11 veterans community that has has grown and is represented on this call just like the vva veterans groups are never going to give up on this issue i want to make sure everyone all the members understand that people who are voicing concerns about the cost and the pace and that kind of thing like they're going to keep fighting for these people even god forbid as some of them pass away and that'll make them fight harder so yes we lost a lot of blue water navy veterans before the presumption finally came into effect, but that is gonna make the veterans community work harder and harder and harder to establish these presumptions. Um, they're not giving up. And so in, in a lot of ways, I think this discussion of, you know, what is the exact standard? How are we gonna do it? When we're gonna do it at the pace is a little bit ap academic. This is happening. Uh, the American public supports this. I mean, Mr. Stewart said, America loves its veterans in a specific way. We know that the American public will support this because eventually, they got there on Agent Orange. We don't need it to take that long. We can all see what direction this is going. And that's why I think it, it makes sense to act now. The whole purpose of a presumption is that we are saying there is inexactitude here and the tie goes to the veteran. So to the extent that I have a question, Mr. Brown, I just wanted to ask if, if you were, I don't know if anyone had ever done a, a study or a, a calculation of, of all that was lost in the time that Vietnam veterans were waiting for, um, you know, benefits for hypertension and hypothyroid and all the different things that you've had to fight for even in recent years, bladder cancer. Um, but if you could fill us in on, on maybe the cost of, of waiting uh, so that this committee understands how, how stupid it is for us to try to punt this further down the field. Well, the cost of waiting, uh, how do you put a cost on a life? Somebody who served this country is dying from different types of cancers, rare cancers, uh, from exposures they were uh, exposed to on their deployments. And I mean, I don't know how you put a cost on a life for people that the government sent in the harm's way to start with. I mean, I, I, I can't begin to understand that concept or to 
uh, see how you can properly put a cost on an individual's life. Uh, what I can tell you concerning Title IV is that uh, VA, for the last 15 years, VA's own research has shown significant increases in hypertension among herbicide-exposed veterans. Even giving existing framework for adding new herbicide presumptive conditions, VA failed to do so. This should serve as a powerful cautionary tale to uh, the overly optimistic proponents for creating a new one-size-fits-all but doesn't framework. That leaves VA in the driver's seat. In this legislation, we most strongly support the provision for adding name presumptive conditions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. And thank you, Mr. Lamb. Um, I too, like you, have a, a huge Vietnam Veterans of America chapter in my area. Um, and I uh, was shocked as you were. Uh, Dr. Ruiz, um, I'm sure you have plenty to say on this topic. Uh, uh, you're, I call on you next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to all the BSOs and the leadership and the veterans that are out there for your tremendous steadfast uh, work, your perseverance and your strong leadership. Look, uh, this is a very important title uh, that we need to discuss. This is the crux, the soul uh, of the bill. Uh, it is based on uh, a bill that you all work together uh, to produce. Uh, it's the presumptive benefits for war fighters exposed to burn pits and other toxins act. It is a bipartisan and bicameral bill that originated from our veteran communities. Uh, and we're moving it forward as now title four of this important bill. It is the soul of honoring our PACT Act. It is the vital organ that keeps this patient alive in order to ensure that we give the care and the benefits that the veterans need and their widowed spouses who are relying on this. It is the part that addresses the family as well. But before I continue to go there, I just wanna review some of the excuses that I've been hearing over and over and over. First is this, wait a minute, we need to do more research on this because it goes back to the original excuse that there's not enough evidence. Look guys, I've said over and over clarifying this misinformation. There is enough evidence to suggest that toxic burn pit smoke can produce illnesses in the lungs and cancers and autoimmune diseases. Carcinogens cause cancer. Burn pit toxic smoke contains cancer. They've identified uh, carcinogens in the soil. Burn pit exposed veterans are developing cancer. Where the hell do you think they got it from? Okay, it's very, it's very straightforward. There's enough evidence from extrapolating from firefighters who were exposed to 9-11 and jet fuel that was, that was burnt. There is enough evidence in our own U.S. environmental research that has already banned burn pits from being conducted in our backyards or as industries in the United States. So there is enough evidence with a high enough suspicion that burn pits are causing this illnesses and we don't have to go beyond the scientific papers. We can just listen to our veterans and our veterans' widows who are crying out over and over again, who say that they have no other risk factors, that they're absolutely healthy, and now they're dying or they're dead from all these different illnesses. The other, the other excuse has been that, oh, this will be too much of a strain for the institution. These are unfunded mandates and we don't know how the institution are going to handle it. It is our responsibility to fund what our veterans need and we must do that for our veterans. That strain in the institution argument is from individuals who put the institution first. And I'm telling you, we must put our veterans first. We must give our veterans and be veteran centric, veteran focused and take care of our veterans like we take care of our patients in the emergency department that I know of quite well. The other excuse is that we cost too much. It costs too much money. Now, listen, that's a value statement. 
And I don't know about you all, but my value is to put people first, is to make sure that our veterans are taken care of. My value, instead of giving tax breaks in the tunes of millions and billions to 1% rich individual families in our nation, is to give the veterans the care that they need because they need it right now before they're dying. The other excuse is that the pace is too fast. The pace is too fast. This is ridiculous. Ask the widows of our veterans if it was if we're moving too fast. Ask folks like Leroy and others who are suffering from constrictive bronchiolitis who are 100% oxygen dependent and therefore unable to care for their family work or others if we're moving too fast. When I hear and veterans hear that the pace is too fast, what they're hearing is that they want to delay until dead. Just like what happened with Agent Orange and our Vietnam veterans. And so, look, since I've heard about this, I've been getting real-time feedback from the veterans in my district. Uh, and I want to tell you about Alejandro Camacho of Palm Desert, who is a veteran who answered the call to duty. While serving in South Sinjar, Iraq, Alejandro breathed in toxic fumes, particulate matter, and carcinogens from the batteries, medical waste, jet fuel, and other military uh, uh, items that were disposed of in large burn pits on his base. When he returned home, he noticed that his, that his breathing in the fumes had caused a toll on his body. He was later diagnosed with aggressive form of testicular cancer. Despite his doctor's belief that his diagnosis was linked to his exposure to burn pits, the VA denied his claim because they said, quote, there wasn't enough evidence, unquote. I have a Palm Desert Councilwoman here, Karina Quintanilla, who tells me that her, her ex-husband is still having constant coughing, chronic coughing illnesses after being uh, deployed in the Middle East. Ms. Birch, have you heard from members of your organization that have been diagnosed with cancer that their doctors believe is linked to burn pit exposure and were and their claims were denied by the VA? Yes, uh, we've heard from numerous members and through our survey that reaches thousands and thousands of veterans across the country that there are plenty of veterans right now that are getting denied benefits that have cancer, rare cancer. And and you look at these veterans and they're young, you, like me, I'm 34, I look healthy, right? I'm not, I got all kinds of medical issues. And they push you to the side and say, oh, well, you can't have cancer. You know, you're young, you're healthy. And then later, you know, they find out later, oh, well, you did have cancer. We don't know how you got it, but now it's stage four and well, well, good luck. Yeah, uh, uh, sadly, this is a common theme throughout our veteran story. What we need is to end the excuses, to take care of our veterans, to pass the Honoring Our PACT Act, and making sure that, uh, that the uh, uh, presumptive benefits for warfighters section in this Title IV is maintained. For those of you who think that this is the way we're going to save costs or nickel and dime our veterans by eliminating some of the cancers or pulmonary illnesses that are listed in this list, I have news for you. You will not go and attempt this without resistance or without a fight, because this is what's going to save lives. This is what's going to bring justice to the widows who are currently suffering, trying to raise their families. And we will fight tooth and nails to make sure that this section is maintained. Um, thank, you. I, thank you, Dr. Okay. Uh, Mr. Brown, I got to give the last word to, to on this section, on this section uh, to uh, Mr. Field, who's been waiting patiently. Um, so uh, thank you, Dr. Ruiz. Uh, thank you for clarifying this issue about the rare cancers. By definition, they're rare. Uh, and uh, the, the, the more expensive pre presumptions are, already, are, are currently being dealt with by the VA, the, the, the respiratory presumptions. So uh, Mr. Field, go ahead. John, are you, are you still with us? Did he go? He might, he might have had to, uh, to run out to do some, he had some 9-11 okay. business that he, that he had to right. do. But to, to drive home his point, uh, I'm going to give you guys the worst case scenario for presumption. The worst case for presumption is simply this, that somewhere along the line, the VA will pay the health, cost, and benefit 
for someone who sacrificed and fought for this country for their colon cancer. And it turns out that their colon cancer wasn't necessarily caused by a burn pit. Maybe it was caused by bacon. That's your worst case scenario in terms of, of presumption. You know, the VA and, and, and this body have to remove their blinders. The evidence on the carcinogens that are in this smoke is overwhelming in, in medical papers outside of the National Academy. It all exists. And the 9-11 Health and Compensation Program exists as well as a model. And one that is a blueprint that could easily be followed uh, if the will was there. It works, it's effective, it honors the taxpayers, it's not wasteful, it's not fraudulent, it doesn't fail audits like the Pentagon does. So uh, if you're looking for a responsible program that can help finally address the toxic exposure issues that so many in the veterans community have suffered for so many years, it's there. Well, thank you, Mr. Stewart. Um, I uh, now want to move on to Title uh, five, and I want to thank you all for the discussion on Title IV. Um, and, uh, I, I now call on Mr. Uh, Tampi uh, to begin our discussion on Title V on research matters. Mr. Tampi, go ahead. All right. Thank you so much, Chairman Takano, and thank you again, Ranking Member Boss and members of this committee for taking the time to listen to us all here. So Title V authorizes VA to conduct scientific research that will impact veterans and their families affected both today and in the future if our military is sent to areas with airborne toxins or hazards. It's critical for VA to understand how toxic exposures will affect veterans currently suffering from illnesses that have yet to be identified at the VA at this time. The VA will lead coordinating authority, with toxic exposure related studies and establish a strategic plan to ensure that the research is collaborative, transparent and coordinated with oversight being provided by HVAC and SVAC committees. Now, one point I just wanna make um, before turning it over, the VA has a reputation of being reactionary and when trying to provide care for veterans in the past, we just, we can't let, we can't, wait for another 40 years before this generation of the global war on terror veterans to receive their health care. Paradigm shift must, uh, must occur to transform the VA so they can tackle toxic exposures in the future. Being proactive, this research is what allows them to determine what common illnesses are affecting Gulf War veterans today, what common cancers are post 9-11 veterans going to get in 10 years, in 15 years, where these, the studies relating to cancers that are determined to be positively associated with identified toxic exposure veterans. And then we have to think about the families and the dependents of veterans and the feasibility of providing CHAMP VA benefits to those dependents for healthcare costs. Um, all that we're, the main goal of this section is to have, allow VA to have that crown jewel of research that they do have. And this section is what allows them to do that. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Tampi. Um, I'll begin with uh, my question under Title V. Um, so the VA requests that we strike our dependent healthcare study, um, stating that no science or evidence has been uh, found by the NASEM um, that uh, connects adverse health outcomes of a dependent or an individual in utero with exposures unique to the veteran. Is this a study worth pursuing on behalf of our veteran dependents? Um, quick reactions. Yes. Yes. So I, I'm not seeing any, any of our VSO say it's not, uh, it's not a worthy study. Um, so I'm gonna just move on to Ranking Member Boss. Go ahead, Ranking Member Boss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Adi, I, I just want you to expand on this. This is actually directed towards you because I think you mentioned it in your, your opening there. Do you believe VA has been aggressive enough to pursue the research regarding the health effects of toxic exposures with what they've done so far? Ranking Member Boss, um, it is my, 
is my personal opinion that um, while the VA has made attempts, um, we, the American Legion, uh, believes that the efforts could be more. <clears throat> Uh, the, there could be um, there could be more efforts to be more collaborative with the VSO community, including us in on um, the pilot study would have been something that I think we, we all would have really appreciated. Um, a lot, we want to we 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 had, those at the VA and we within the VSO communities we're both trying to help veterans. We know that and we understand that they're a partner. At the end of the day, they are our partners and we have to work with them. Um, so I, I don't wanna come off as being disrespectful or rude, um, but um, that we do believe that their efforts could be more collaborative and more transparent. Yeah, I, thank you. I think that many members believe that too, but yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry, Jen. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, one thing is that not coming too hard on, down on the VA, but thinking a little bit outside the box is that the VA, we, we consistently talk about how overworked they are, that they don't have time, it's playing catch up. Well, what about working within the community? I'm a big fan of community over competition, right? How many medical schools do we have in this country? And eager medical, medical students to, that want to research, that want to get their hands into these things. And so why not work with local medical schools. I mean, you have National Jewish Health, CU, Johns Hopkins, the list goes on, right? And work together with the VA and to remove some of that burden on the VA in hopes that the research can come along quicker to make sure that the research is now backing up the healthcare needs of, of veterans and making sure that they're being taken care of. And then one other point was that uh, I keep hearing you say, you know, you, everyone's looking for the solution. What do we do? And well, although we can't, you know, veterans that are already outside of active duty service, it's going to be harder to go back and, and get to them. However, we still have active duty service members still serving that were exposed to burn pits. And one idea that I've kind of shot around in my head is that when I was getting out of the military, I had to go through, a I went through a medical board because I was retired, right? Well, they do a scan, they tell you what's going on. Well, have questions to ask these members, are you experiencing this, da, 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 da. And so the other thing is that they do x-rays. Well, I had an x-ray on my chest because I had been exposed and prior coughing and, and so forth. And so that x-ray showed this nodule that I had no idea was there. Next thing I know, I'm getting scans and all of this stuff. And so many veterans are getting out of the military without any of that preventative screening or seeing what's going on within their bodies. And because I did, they could go back and service connect and I got my disability. Well, so many other veterans don't show, start showing symptoms until afterwards. But if they had that percent, you know, specific screening, that wouldn't be the case and they wouldn't be getting denied their benefits. So why don't we lean, you know, lay the framework for this preventative stuff and this screening that at least helps some of the veterans that were exposed to toxic exposure now instead of uh, retroactively. Right, that's a good idea. I yield back. Thank you, thank you, Rick Mayor Boss. Uh, Mr. Mr. Vail. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the BA would like to say that um, you know more needs to be done uh, as far as research to establish presumptions and. You know, it's not exactly career enhancing for a research or VA to find uh, research uh, to support more benefits. Uh, we think more needed is done at VA. And also these presumptives are crucial. Our Vietnam vets don't have a whole lot of time left. You look at the age of our Vietnam vets and the poor health that they're in, and they don't have time to fight uh, an appeal to win their claim. Uh, the BVA, we just won a, a, a Thailand vet, $400,000. He's been fighting this for 25 years. And we tried to go the direct service connection route and they kept denying it um, more, more denials. We had to take it up to the board and our Vietnam vets don't have time to go up to the board. And the presumption is easier to grant than direct service connection. And it eliminates the many shades of gray that exist. Like for example, for, for being getting service connected for Thailand, uh, the current, the current uh, rules are it's, uh, it's too complicated and the Raiders don't wanna take a risk and granting it Asking a VSO, how many times have we been told, oh, well, I can't grant this. If you want it granted, you have to go to the board because the board has more authority to grant. 
I have a memo from OGC that says otherwise, the board and their ROs have the same authority to grant. But these raiders, there's, there's a corporate culture at VA, they do not want to grant Thailand Agent Orange claims. But again, our Vietnam vets are running out of time. They don't have time to fight an appeal at the board. So we, VBA fully supports section 403 for, the, for these presumptions because it makes it easier uh, to service connect. And the Raiders, I've, I've audited Raiders ROs and they've told me when I come to work, I don't think, what can I do to best serve this veteran? I come to work thinking, how can I maximize the points for this claim to, so I can meet my quota so I don't get fired? And, and so, the easier you make it for the Raider to make their points, the more likely you are to get a grant. And that's why these presumptions are, are, so, are so helpful and so important. And, and lastly, the, um, again, we, we support the uh, section 403. Um, and I yield back my time. Thank you. I have, I have a question, if you don't mind, Chairman. Quickly, go ahead, Mr. Brown. Yes, uh, this, this is going back to the, uh, the previous title, uh, 403, Vietnam Veterans of America and DCS, uh, we do not support changing the current framework for Vietnam Veterans presumptive making process that's currently on the books. This new, uh, under the Honor Our Pact Act, uh, it leaves a more restrictive uh, uh, presumptive making policy and um, we feel that, uh, you know, looking at, like I mentioned that study earlier for 15 years, the VA had a study showing hypertension and higher rates in Vietnam herbicide exposed veterans. Uh, they never acted upon that study, even though it clearly, it's their own research. And uh, lastly, from the same section in the honor in our pact, uh, uh, section 405, concerning Gulf War veterans. Uh, for the most part, uh, this section, uh, uh, VBA, VBA and VCS do support. However, we need to find out what comes from the high denial rates of the Gulf War veteran presumptive claims that's been going on for 20 years and is well documented uh, what, what will this legislation do to address that? We met with this committee before the pandemic took place and shut right before they shut down Capitol Hill. And we were promised a round table to address that matter. And it never came, it never came fruitation. So, uh, just because we're adding presumptives, it, uh, is the VA going to be able to do these presumptives where it's still not leading to a 73% denial rate, like with the Gulf War veterans, chronic multi-symptom illness presumptives, and a 93% denial rate for uh, the undiagnosed illness presumptive for them. All right. All right. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Brown. Well, duly noted, duly noted, well, uh, your uh, uh, Input uh, from VBA will be def def duly noted. I'm going to now move on uh, to the next uh, Mr. title, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ranking Member. Yes, I'd like to first off apologize to everyone. I have a hard stop. I've got to get to another area. I, I'm really, this is vitally important. Um, we're going to continue to monitor this, and, and uh, I, I appreciate the, the time that we've had today, uh, and I apologize that I have to leave. I thank you for your interest, and I thank you, and I know your staff is uh, with us, and, and, and taking in all the information as well. So I, I appreciate you. your participation, Mr. Boss. All right, um, we did we move on to uh, Ms. Uh, to uh, right, uh, Title VI. And Lindsay, I know you were in the queue to comment. Perhaps you can combine your comments with uh, um, at, the, at the end of your uh, discussion opener on Absolutely. Title VI. So uh, Lindsay, you're recognized uh, to open up discussion on Title VI and maybe to add uh, some more of your comments uh, generally. Fantastic. Thank you, Chairman Takano, Ranking Member Boast, and members of the committee. MEA is grateful for the work this committee is doing to address toxic exposure. We believe that toxic exposure should not be a byproduct of service, but since it is, it's impact to address, excuse me, it's in, imperative to address to the issue with healthcare plus benefits without delay. As part of the Honoring Our PACT Act is the improvement of resources and training regarding toxic exposed veterans. 
The importance of these provisions cannot be understated. We can change or we can make the best and most sound policy, but without the ability to implement these changes agency-wide and get information to veterans in places they need it most, we will be building these policies in vain. Our members continue to report denial of their claims for toxic exposure related illnesses and from being added to the burn pit registry, sometimes waiting years for their claims to even be reviewed, then even more in appeals trying to overturn these decisions. These delays and denials are not just time consuming and frustrating. They can take place as, a veteran, as veterans are fighting off illnesses that could very well take their lives in the meantime. Additionally, included in this provision is outreach to veterans regarding benefits. We urge that concerted efforts be focused on reaching hard to reach and underserved veteran communities, namely minority veterans, who have been disenfranchised or who have been deterred from even applying for benefits based on information from their peers about their denial. Given that many minority veterans, even in the absence of burn pits, are already at increased risk for, cancer, for, for many cancers and other illnesses, and that whole minority veterans were stationed at places like Fort McClellan, Alabama, outreach and getting this information into their hands can, can and will save lives. Um, in section 505, uh, we wanted to address the fact that there is age and gender, but race is not included in this in the research. We believe it's imperative for two reasons. One, because many minority veterans, specifically racial ethnic minority veterans, are more likely to already have an increased propensity for, for, contra or for developing cancer and other, re other related illnesses. We need to include race in this, in this conversation to ensure that we're looking at this from the research perspective. In addition, you also have higher rates of uh, veterans and minority veterans who are in combat roles where they are more likely to be exposed to these toxic chemicals. So adding race as a provision in the research is imperative to understanding the whole picture. Uh, in addition, sorry, I, I'm not very um, aggressive, so I didn't get in there earlier in the conversation, but going back to ranking member Bo's question about whether or not we provide healthcare now and benefits and have this conversation later. Um, yes, it's important and nobody's gonna here is gonna disagree that we need to be providing healthcare for these issues. No one here is gonna disagree about that. But looking at history if from the minority veteran perspective, every time that something is rolled out without direct and intentional design, minority veterans are left out. So if we continue to do this, we're going to see higher rates of in, uh, higher rates of denial among minority veterans and less access for minority veterans if we don't design this with very specific intention. So it's our opinion that you absolutely have to be doing this with intention and not just rolling out benefits to say we're going to meet the stop gap right now. We want to see that happen, but so many people are being turned away, then who are we actually serving? And going back to Mr. Stewart's comment about the national security issue, you're 100% correct. Service relies on trust. Military veterans have to trust the institution in order to keep going. I'm a third generation service member. Do you think that I'm gonna tell my child to serve after I've seen this? Absolutely not. If my parents or my, or my grandparents had seen that this conversation, they would have told me the same. You're going to limit the number of people that are able to serve in the military. In addition, as a veteran myself, I served and I was told I have to follow and obey lawful orders. Who is making the DOD do this? If, there is, if there's a provision that says that you can't have burn pits in the United States of America, why are United States troops being exposed to these in other areas? Who is making sure that the Department of Defense is following those same lawful orders that you're asking us to uphold? It is not fair, and we all know that. The DOD is responsible for paying for this if we can't from the veterans' benefits. We have to make sure that somebody is paying for this. We didn't, it was not our fault. We followed lawful orders and we were told if we're gonna get sent somewhere, if we're gonna go somewhere that the DOD is telling us to go, we're gonna follow lawful orders. If we had walked away, we would have been a deserter. We would have ended up ruining, ruining our lives and getting dishonorable discharges because we walked away. We didn't have a choice. People were all stuck there. They were stuck walking laps. They were, you continue to hear people that say, I was ready to die for my country, but I didn't think it would happen five years after dying from cancer. That's our community's legacy. That is 9-11's legacy. And we have to do better in order to keep that trust, to keep that national security intact. If we can afford to send people to war, we can take care of those warriors when they come back home in a culture that celebrates veterans so deeply. Thank you, Chairman. Well, thank you, Ms. Church. Wow, that was very powerful. Um, you know, with, your indul with the indulgence of the group here, I would like to get Mr. Titus to, uh, uh, open up discussion on Title Seven, so we can do Title Seven and Title Six together. Um, and then um, I did see members that had their hands raised. Mr. Elzy, uh, you're in the queue for that, so I'll be calling on you after I call on Mr. Titus. Mr. Titus, go ahead and begin our discussion and open up our discussion on, on Title Seven. 
Thank you, Chairman. Um, and uh, thank you, Ranking Member Boston, members of the HVAC. We appreciate you holding this roundtable discussion, to discuss toxic exposures and honoring our PACT Act. Mo believes that comprehensive toxic exposure reform is long overdue, and we applaud the committee's dedication to this issue. We support the Honoring Our PACT Act, and I appreciate the opportunity to share our thoughts on Title VII, uh, the section on health registries and records. This title takes several important steps to increase awareness and capture data, old and new, on toxic exposures. Section 701 creates a health registry uh, for per and uh, polyfluoroalkylized substances. As we, and as we learn more about the harms of PFAs and the prevalence of exposures within our community, a health registry is vital to ensure the resources for uh, vital, uh, vital resource for service members and veterans. Section 702 shows us why. It establishes a health registry for individuals stationed at Fort McClellan. While VA recognizes there, there was over 60, or 67 disposal sites at Fort McClellan, the current contained a variety of toxic substances that service members and their families were exposed to over the years. VA has not recognized any health, adverse health effects from those who uh, were there. Creating a registry is an important step to gather data on the health conditions of those who served under a variety of circumstances. Section 703 and 704 require reporting on ILER and collecting this information to, is important because it ensures an understanding of all the exposure service members face. And th this section requires regular reporting on the effectiveness and accuracy of the data, the data that is vital to oversight efforts here. ILER can be helpful to service members and veterans and we are encouraged by the transparency and oversight offered by these sections. However, it's important to remember because of the nature of war, there will always be exposure data limitations and we should not hold ILER data gaps against veterans. And this is why section 705 is so important and this pr which provides a path for service members and veterans to correct their exposure, exposure records. We should be empowering veterans uh, and service members to provide a way for them to interact with their health records. And ILER has a lot of potential to do so. And what we need to make sure is this is uh, linked and connected throughout the DOD in, a, in an effective way. The sections in Title VII work to address veterans uh, overlooked for generations and provide a path forward to learn from our mistakes and better care for future generations. So we encourage these elements are included if the, cost of, or the Honoring Our PACT Act is passed or any comprehensive reform efforts. So thank you, Chairman. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Titus. Um, I see uh, 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 Ms. Kieran uh, from, uh, Ms. Keenan, Ms. Keenan, Ms. Keenan from the VFW. Um, you like to comment on either title? Uh, thank you, Chairman Takano. Uh, Christina Keenan, VFW, just filling in for, for Pat Murray, who had to step away. Um, on, on Title Seven, I think, what, it, what this really does is recognizes that toxic exposures can even occur on domestic military installations. Um, and, and, you know, it's just sort of uh, touching back to Title II and improving the framework in which VA recognizes presumptives. That's so, in, it's so critical because there will be new exposures. There are already new exposures. Um, and so the, this entire comprehensive package is, is so critical because there are going to be things that we need to address in the future. And, and Title VII is, is really starting to point towards what those new things um, already are. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keenan. Um, I, uh, Mr. Mr. Morosky, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a comment on Title VI, which is the training. Um, I think that this title doesn't necessarily get as much attention as some of the other ones that we've talked about so far, but uh, it's extremely important uh, for healthcare providers to have better training on toxic exposures, which I think Rosie talked about earlier, but also for Veterans Benefits Administration personnel to get better training on toxic exposures. You know, the culture at VA has been brought up a couple of times, and when it comes to toxic exposure claims, um, you know, it's one of, quite frankly, denial. Um, you know, the VBA is pretty good. The, the, the Veterans Disability Claim System works pretty well uh, on most things, uh, except for toxic exposures. Um, you know, I, I've used this analogy before that, um, you know, a, if a claims adjudicator looks at uh, a claim of a person who was, uh, you know, a parachute jumper, 
uh, and says, hey, look, you've got, you know, 50 parachute training jumps and now you've got bad knees, they're willing to, uh, you know, make the connection and say that, yes, as likely as not, your bad knees were caused by your parachute jumps. But when they look at somebody who was exposed to a burn pit for two years and then they have pancreatic cancer, uh, they're not willing to say, they say, well, you may have had, may have had the pancreatic cancer anyway. Um, you know, we need to make sure that VBA personnel know that they can grant those claims, uh, you know, and, and, and in the same way that they grant claims for, for physical disabilities. So I just wanted to make that point, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morosky. Um, Mr. Elzey, um, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Brothers and sisters uh, from the military, all veterans, thank you for joining us today. The work you're going to be that you've done today, the sacrifices you have made, are going to improve health care for uh, my children when my son, when he becomes a veteran, when he goes into the military and enters combat. This is about the next war as well, and your sacrifices are not going to be unnoticed. This is a very emotional topic, Mr. Stewart. Thanks for all your advocacy, both for uh, me and our veterans and uh, the 9/11 Commission. You. You have uh, improved the lives of many, given a great deal of attention to this very serious subject. I want to point out the fact that going forward, there's a there's a degree of responsibility that DOD does have. We they do a great job of recruiting, training, sending to war all of uh, the young men and women who choose to serve. They don't train you to be a civilian, and when they kick you out, they say, "There's the VA. Good luck, Godspeed. We're all counting on you." That has got to change. No veteran should become a veteran without first receiving a complete medical workup of all the problems that they have beforehand before they become civilian day one. Until that occurs, it is incumbent on the military, when we do go into combat, you are exposed to, whether you're on an aircraft carrier, whether you're dropping bombs, whether you're getting shot at, ingesting all different kinds of chemicals and gases, the military must do a better job. The medics that you're working with on the ground must be annotating these forays into combat in which you're exposed to things because right now the, the responsibility is on the VA and the veteran themselves to point out what they've been exposed to. We can no longer accept that. Any combat we go into from here forward must be incumbent on the DOD and the medics and the officers that are in charge of, of uh, all of their troops going into combat to say, we were exposed. Take care of them right now. Note it in the medical record so that when you step out of your military time, you will be taken care of and we won't have to have these conversations anymore. So I yield back. Thank God for all of you. Thanks for your sacrifices. I'm sorry if any of you have, have had any uh, difficulties with the VA. Uh, DOD uh, owes you a lot more too, and we need to fix that problem. So thank, thanks to all of you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your sentiments, Mr. Elzey. And, uh... Hopefully we can get you on the bill. Uh, uh, is any, I, I see Mr. Titus, uh, you have a response or a comment, Mr. Titus? Um, I just wanna add one more thing, Chair, Mr. Chairman, in regards to talking about the research matters um, in Title V. I, um, this is a lifelong situation. When, when our service members are exposed to toxic uh, substances, we need to continue the efforts and continue following the research throughout their entire lives. To paint the picture, a, a study came out just last year about the increased risk of dementia for service members exposed to Agent Orange decades prior. <clears throat> so I think that we need to continue to follow these issues through, th throughout service members' lives and through uh, to the next generation of potential service member as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mervan. Chairman, Chairman Takano, I want to thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to thank all the veterans for being here and for sharing your stories and for advocating uh, for our American veterans. That being said, it is a matter of priority and intentions, as Mr. Stewart had talked about, and how we value our veterans and provide them the benefits necessary. I don't believe now is the time to nickel and dime on issues and that are a matter of life and death for our American veterans. Uh, and I also want to emphasize the value of um, making sure that we give the most effective, efficient ways necessary to be able to benefit our veterans and how we do that in the speed in which we can to be able to serve them. Um, and ultimately, uh, I'm, I'm brought back to a time uh, during the 4th of July 
uh, right after we passed this piece of legislation uh, before the CBO came back and I was in a parade uh, and was able to speak to many veterans and was able to talk about you know, the benefits that are necessary. And there were many stories of people who stopped me where they weren't quite sure what was uh, affecting them, but they knew something was wrong. And so this piece of legislation, uh, the Honoring Our, Our Pact Act, uh, make sure we don't leave veterans behind. With that, um, as chairman of the subcommittee on technology modernization, uh, I've been reviewing the VA's IT investment to include those made in the VBA. It's my understanding that when benefits were expanded to the Blue Water Navy veterans exposed to the Agent Orange VBA struggle, VBA struggled to manage the surge in claims and required an increase in infrastructure and in IT support funding to enable faster processing of veterans' claims. Um, Ms. Keenan from the VFW and Lindsay, if you could, uh, I would like to hear your perspectives regarding VA's ability to execute on this important legislation. Uh, we have not made enough of an investment to modernize the veterans benefit management system, and I want to support VA in providing the benefits included in the PACT Act. Um, and this is a, an all-encompassing, if you can answer that question, perspective. Hi, I'll, I'll just jump in, Christina from the VFW. Um, as, as part of the independent budget uh, VSOs, we, we are planning to recommend um, additional funding for VBA to modernize and upgrade their, their IT systems in order to deal with the current backlog of claims and for the potential future uh, increase in toxic exposure claims. Um, this is likely a multi-year project, um, but we are making those formal recommendations through uh, the independent budget with our partners at PVA and DAB. So we um, also support the recommendation to increase the uh, budget and increase the capacity of VBA to address these claims. We recognize um, we're hearing from members across the board that they're waiting four and a half years. There's 80,000 people in front of them that they don't know how long it's going to take, that they're getting denied. Um, and we also know at the same time that VA's technology infrastructure is lacking severely in, in decades behind. And so in order to make this happen, we need to be building those structures now to be able to best support when this actually does pass and when this goes through, because we can't use the surge of claims as an, as an excuse for not moving this legislation forward. VA has to be making those investments now. They already know that this is an issue. So we have to be prioritizing this to ensure that the capacity is grown of VA to be able to address these claims. 80,000 people after four and a half years is, is absurd. Um, so making sure that people have the ability to get through this process in their lifetimes, which may or may, may not be four and a half years. Thank you, Ms. Church. Um, I'm gonna call on Mr. Brown and Mr. Cawthorn. Uh, uh, Mr. Brown, go ahead quickly. Yes, <clears throat> to give you an example of, of how difficult these rare cancers are uh, to get service connected. I work directly with two different VA secretaries, uh, Secretary Bob McDonald and Secretary Dr. David Shulkins to get a brain cancer presumptive based upon VA's own research for Gulf War veterans. Uh, they pushed this all the way to the o Office of Management and Budget, and it was denied in 2016. And then Dr. Shulkins did the same in 2017, and it was denied. So, you know, even with the research and VA wanting to do the right thing, you had other agencies who didn't see fit to grant the funding for them. Uh, thank you for bringing that up, Mr. Brown. It was, remember, it was OMB. It was not, it was technically an agency, but OMB is basically the tool of the, the, the president at the time. So uh, I thank you for bringing that example up. Um, uh, Mr. Cawthorn, uh, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Ranking Member Boss, thank you, Mr. Stewart, all of our representatives from all these great organizations. I appreciate you all being here. Uh, I'd like to direct this question to Ms. Ms. Keenan with the uh, with the VFW or Lindsay or Alex, uh, when would you believe is the ideal time to let veterans know when they are eligible and what benefits they are eligible for when it is in regards to burn pits? Is that before they leave the service? Is I mean, I, I think Mr. Elsey brought up a great point of uh, really 
enlightening and informing these these soldiers and these Marines and these sailors about when they're leaving the service to become veterans, uh, when they should learn about all of these uh, these ideas. So I'll open the floor to anyone who wants to answer that. Um, I'll, I'll just jump in very quickly. Um, I mean, you know, during the TAP program is, is definitely not too early. Um, the VFW does have, uh, you know, accredited service officers on military installations to help facilitate, um, you know, applying for their benefits even before they're discharged. Um, but, you know, the earlier, the better. I mean, the, what some of the complaints that we've, we've heard with veterans in re regards to VA is just the lack of information, um, whether it's through email, through technology, or, or just at the VA um, on what their benefits are and what they can do if they believe that they were exposed to toxic substances. So there really isn't a point of time that is too early, um, whether it's in service as they're transitioning or right at, at their first point of contact with the Department of Veterans Affairs. And I'll jump in real quick. Um, I, I agree that it should happen at the very latest as they're transitioning from service. But in honesty, as a veteran myself, I would say before they go on deployment, um, we should be talking about toxic exposure before anybody's exposed. We should have options like veterans don't. Like I said in the beginning, we, we don't have an option to walk away from post. We don't have an option to walk away from a burn pit, but we should. We should have options when it comes to whether or not we're willing to go in and expose ourselves. So before, before getting exposed and if it happens while you're on deployment or while you're in, in, in theater, you should be told when you're leaving. And from there, you should only be told more because that's going to that's going to increase prevention and early detection. Because what's happening now is people get four and a half, 10 years into their serve or attended their post post exposure and they're dying. Why are we not looking at this 10 years ago when they were exposed and making sure that they have all the tools that they need to manage what's coming? You know, like they shouldn't be caught off guard by cancer or as like asthma or something that they weren't expecting when DOD and VA knew full well 15 years ago. Thank you, Ms. Church. I'm going to go to Mr. Lerman. His hand was up first, and then uh, Mr. Tampa, your hand was up, and then Mr. Brown. Uh, Mr. Lerman, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I greatly appreciate it. I just want to make a comment in reference to what Representative Morvan was talking about, uh, VA IT infrastructure. That's very important. They could hire 10,000 more people to help, but if we don't have the tools to expedite the process now, we're going to be in a world of hurt. There's over 200,000 pending backlog claims today. So in a heavy investment in VA's infrastructure, IT systems, and just to point what we saw yesterday, uh, the automation that is being tested out in the, at the Boise VA regional office for increased claims. We should be heavily investing in that in VA so that we, one, don't have backlog claims, and two, we never have to hear well, we can't take care of that because VA doesn't have the resources and infrastructure. We should be paying ahead so the system is set up to handle whatever comes its way and toxic exposed veterans stop paying the price. Thank you, Mr. Lehrman. Mr. On, on what he's talking about there, Chairman, with technology and capacity. Yes. Mr. Tampi, go ahead. Thank you, Chairman Takano. And yes, sir, to just answer uh, Congressman Cawthorn, um, at least 12 years ago in the Marine Corps, before and after you deployed, there was pre-deployment training and post-deployment training. That's a perfect time for the education to be provided about what a toxic, uh, what a burn pit is, what airborne hazards are, have been known to be wherever they're going. Um, whether it's a pamphlet, a PowerPoint, or just talking to Navy Corpsman Doc, uh, something should be in that pre-deployment and post-deployment training. <clears throat> well, Mr. Tampi and, and Lindsay, if you don't mind me asking one quick follow-up question, I, I, forgive my ignorance for I, I've never served before, but are, are people that are being deployed, do their commanding officers of the Department of Defense, do they normally know that there's a burn pit active or that these, these airborne pathogens are in the area at, before the deployment happens? So I can explain to you what I remember from 12 years ago in my anecdotal uh, story, but um, I was the junior corporal in my shop. So uh, when you're the junior guy in your shop, sometimes you volunteer, sometimes you get voluntold. Uh, I, I would get voluntold to take out the trash occasionally well, once a week. And sometimes you'd see a trash pit, a trash bin, a recycling bin, and then a burn bin. And the burn bin would be full of 
what I remember the most were envelopes because you don't want your parents' addresses, your friends' addresses. You don't want that to just get thrown away in a combat zone. You want to burn that so that it's operation security to protect that information. Um, so once or twice a week, I would empty that burn burn box, take it to the junior private in the squadron. And then that poor kid would have to go walk to the burn pit and breathe in. I'm sure he went every three days um, whenever the burn box would fill. Um, but that's what I remember from uh, the air wing and the Marine Corps on a, in a C-130 squadron 12 years ago. <clears throat> I'd also like to make a point there on that too, is that you're asking if commanders know about this. Well, the DOD overall knew about this because the contractors who start the burn pits wherever we're at make the DOD sign a letter stating that the DOD can never go back and pursue suit against the contractor for the burn pits because here's a list of the known effects and toxic exposures that are going to come from these burn pits that can further cause health impacts down the road. And so the DOD is the one signing these contracts, you know, to the contractors to protect the contractors because they know how bad these are. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for that, Ms. Birch. Mr. Morosky. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. A um, couple of quick things. One, I wanted to re respond to Congressman Cawthorn because I think he uh, had asked for my input on his question as well. And I agree with what's already been said is that it can't be too early to start telling people about these issues. But, you know, um, no matter how good, especially when we're talking about the transition assistance program, no matter how good it gets, it's always going to be drinking from a fire hose and too much information for the person at the time. So you have to tell them then you have to continue to tell them afterwards, too. Um, you know, these are conversations that every, you know, VA doctor should be having with uh, with a veteran every time, you know, the primary care doctor should be having it with them and bringing up these things. And so there are aspects of the bill that would address that as well. So it's uh, never too early, but it's it's during and it's after as well. Um, and then with um, what Shane was talking about with the backlogs that this could potentially create, hey, we don't like the VA to have backlogs, but some, we don't like backlogs when there's no reason. Some backlogs uh, are good backlogs, and those are backlogs that are occurring simply because we're getting the right veterans into the system. Um, and so, uh, you know, if there was a, a temporary backlog to be created by uh, the PACT Act, uh, that in and of itself is not necessarily a concern with us. Uh, you know, we consider that, uh, you know, par for the course. I want to go well, back. Thank to you, Mr. Thank oh. you, Mr. Morosky. Uh, Mr. Stewart, I'm going to give you the last word. So uh, uh, I'll give you the last word. I, I got to I got to bring this to a close. Let me just say that there is such a thing as uh, the benefit delivery at discharge program, which I did see in action in Korea in the last CODEL I led during Thanksgiving break. That does make a really great great attempt to deliver benefits upon discharge, uh, give the veteran uh, a physical, note any ailments at the time. Uh, but please understand that, Mr. Cawthorn, that this does not conclude the subject matter of today. I mean, even if uh, it, you know, it includes all of the benefits that relate to a bad knee, a hip, uh, something that an ailment, they're still in the service and obviously it's very much easier to determine service connection when you kind of note what's happening in that moment. But benefit delivery at discharge, BDD as the program is called, is not universally available. It was, it's available at some bases in some places, but it's not available everywhere. And even if it were available everywhere, it does not solve this issue of all of our veterans that were exposed to burn pits uh, in the post 9-11 era and in the, uh, the desert storm era, et cetera, et cetera. Mr. Stewart, I'm gonna give you the last word. You've been so uh, patient and uh, I commend you for sticking it through to the very end. Not even our members of Congress do that. Oh. I shouldn't even say not even, it's not surprising, but it's very surprising to see someone uh, who's obviously as-, as oh, I'm, in fact I'm, you incredibly, I'm incredibly busy and popular. And the fact <laughs> that I've been able to do this is a real testament uh, <laughs> to, my, uh, to my stamina. Uh, I wanted to sort of talk about it on, on kind of the bigger scale when we talk about technology and we talk about capacity and we talk about resources and all the different things that we've sort of been uh, knocking around here today, because they all come back to one sort of fundamental truth, and that's priority. 
priority and intention. You know, we keep hearing from uh, members of Congress and people at the VA and DOD, this idea of capacity and this sort of surprise that they all express about the amount of people that may be coming forward. We've been at war for 20 years. DOD is the one who's making the VA's customers. This can all be seen coming from a hundred miles away. DOD and VA both knew their internal documents show in 2008 through 2010, the toxic exposure was a deadly hazard for American troops. VA knew what was coming down. So the idea that all of a sudden there's this capacity surge that no one understood or saw coming, it, it, it's as though they were filling up a bathtub for years and then suddenly went, what's all this water on the floor? You know, we, we've been at war for 20 years. There's 3.5 million veterans. We've had these giant burn pits. We all knew that this was coming. So the idea that we haven't been building capacity up to this point is really negligent on, on everybody's part. And I think the message uh, that DOD has an enormous part to play in this is also true. It's very easy to go after the VA when DOD is the one where there is almost no oversight over the massive resources that they get. And those resources have to also be used to funnel into uh, VA to help them take care of the soldiers and not hurt, hurt force readiness. But part of national security and force readiness is the trust that you build up with the veteran community that you will live up to the obligations that they so clearly have lived up to. And the final point is technology. And this is the one that's almost the most unforgivable. I mean, for God's sakes, you've got DARPA and the Pentagon. They've got robot dogs out there trying to figure out how to diffuse mines. And yet DOD's computer system can't talk to the VA system. And some of these remote VA offices are guys working on typewriters. And, and it sounds like a joke, but it, what it reflects is simply this, priority. The men and women who serve are the greatest asset of the United States military. And yet they are the lowest on the totem pole when it comes to resources. We always have money for the technology. We always have money for the defense contractors. We always have sovereign immunity for the defense contractors. And we always balance the budget on the backs of those who come home and try and uh, reintegrate. And that's the, the change in culture that has to take place. And I know I'm talking to the converted because I'm talking to the VSOs and all the representatives are gone. But damn, man, it's crazy that we're even having this meeting. And, and very thankful that it's getting done, but this thing has to get done and it has to get done with common sense and with intentionality. So thank you very much for, for having this and uh, uh, it is much appreciated. Well, thank you, Mr. Stewart. Uh, I very much appreciated your pointing out the contradictions, the stark contradictions, the, the robot dog uh, comment really hit home. Uh, and I just want to also point out, uh, just to echo some of what Dr. Ruiz said earlier, uh, I mean, it, and it also echoes, I think, uh, what Ms. Ms. Keenan said about uh, that the contractors actually got signed documents from That's DOD right. to say they wouldn't be held liable. Well, the fact is DOD itself is not liable because DOD does not fall under uh, the same regulations that other businesses in the United States fall under, all the other governments fall under, under OSHA. Uh, you know, OSHA standards or local environmental standards would have never allowed these burn pits uh, to have existed. Uh, it's common sense to know that a burn pit uh, of the size that you mentioned earlier, Mr. Stewart, simply would not be tolerated uh, in any community in the bounds of the United States of America, it just would not. Uh, but DOD could do it because DOD is not bound uh, by uh, OSHA regulations, for example. DOD is, a, is an entity unto itself. So I want to thank uh, each of you for your attendance at today's roundtable discussion on the Honor and Our Pact Act. Uh, when our country goes to war, we don't hesitate to pay for the armor, guns, 
and tanks that our service members need. As Mr. Seward said, it's a matter of priorities uh, that we set. Uh, but, you know, armor, guns, and tanks aren't the only cost of war. We must ensure that we keep our promise uh, to toxic exposed veterans. Veterans have already sacrificed so much. They shouldn't have to fight VA or Congress for the benefits they have earned and deserve. No more can Congress cry for fiscal restraint when it comes to paying for the care and benefits of our veterans. It's really time we honor our pact and prioritize veterans and pay the true cost of war. Um, I know that the, the ranking member is had had to, to go. I, ordinarily, I would ask him to make any comments, um, but I do want to thank him uh, and all the Republican members and staff for participating in today's uh, uh, meeting and today's roundtable.